Good morning. Good morning, good day. Welcome to those of you that are here and those of you that are watching, listening from around the world, wherever you're tuning in from at this time. It's good to have you joining us. And I'm grateful to God for who he is and what he's doing in these last days. Some persons who say that they're part of the church doesn't want to talk about that and doesn't want to hear about that because we are so taken up in this world as we see and not all of us are going to see it because some of us we came into the church at a point at a juncture where the standard of God was I mean far removed for a long time now so we came in and what we saw we thought that that was of God and if you take the time to read the scriptures and do not impose yourself on it and it's kind of difficult for some of us not to do that again because of what we have been taught and what we're seeing Wherever the church is present today, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the present state of what we see and call the church. Wherever it is present, in whatever nation it finds itself, what the church has done is to take on the culture of that nation. And the way in which the church interpret the scriptures, it's based on the culture of that nation. And so therefore, the church has lost its relevance to the purposes of God. And it is no longer representing Christ. It's representing its own interests. But yet, we call it God. And that's where it becomes dangerous. Because many persons are not seeing the need to repent. Because they tell themselves that they're doing God's will. We see throughout the scriptures that from the time God called the children of Israel, and it's important for us to pay attention to that because that's when things start to really um, manifest in terms of what God wants to accomplish in the earth through that unique nation. We see in, 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 in the book of Exodus chapter 19, after the children of Israel was taken out of Egypt, out of Egypt have I called my son. So the whole process of delivering them from Egypt, it's a birthing process where God literally birthed a nation. And that nation, God intended for them to be his witness in the earth. They were the nation of God among the nations. And that's why we see even where the law, the commandments and stuff that was given, it was meant to separate them from the nations that were around them. So we see in the commandments, God command them not to practice, not to take on the customs of the nations around them. Because you belong to me. You are my weakness, as he said in Isaiah. So from that moment on, we come to the judges. The judges was judging the nation of Israel. We come to Samuel. The kings was meant to rule over God's people, over God's nation, in the context of representing God's standard. And throughout the prophets, the prophets were speaking to the nation of Israel. They speak about things that would happen to other nations, but... You see the emphasis, the focus was on the nation of Israel, all the way to Malachi. When we come, when we come into the New Testament, if we start with Matthew, Jesus was sent to that nation 
He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Uh, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Jesus never once in his lifetime as a child went out of that region, out of that territory. And we know what happened when God told the father in a dream for the protection of the child. But after that, Jesus never left. Jesus stayed right within. Jesus wept one day. And he looked. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It wasn't just the city itself. The stones and the, the, the martyr and all of that. It was what Jerusalem represented with the people of Israel. How often I would have gathered you as an end gather chickens under her wings, but you would not allow me. Apostles first was released to that nation. We see when Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost, men of Israel and you who fear God, hear me. When by the time we get to chapter 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul said that we were salvation was sent to you first, but because you reject it, we are now turning to the Gentiles. So God began to put the new nation together. That new nation is called the church, the ecclesia, not Israel, but the ecclesia. Scripture talks about the Israel of God. But the church is meant to take people from every nation within the earth, from every walk of life, every background, every language, social status, and bring us into this one new man. And we, the church, ought to be a nation among the nations, but we don't know that. And I wonder how many of you even in this room will hear me today. And how many of you that are watching and listening will hear me today? I wonder. The church is supposed to be a nation that is a city set up on a hill. That all the nations around ought to be looking at that nation. And it, that nation is supposed to give hope to the nations. But if we take on the culture of the nations, how are we going to give them hope? Because if we're like them, you can't give hope to something that you're, you're the same. The church as a nation is supposed to be light. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We take on the cultures, and as a result of that, the salt has lost its flavor. The light has been put out. And what we see and call the church today, it is as much as, as the world is in darkness, the church itself is also in darkness. But there is a remnant, I believe, in these last days that they have an ears to hear and God is separating them and allowing his plans and purposes to be fulfilled because God is not waiting on the multitude to accomplish what he wants. Throughout history, God never do whatever he's doing with the crowd. It was always those faithful few that was committed to him. So, I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. In this room, those of you that are watching and listening, you don't necessarily have to stand, but if you sense the need to do so, then by all means. We're going to pray. And I want to remind you of something that I made mention of on Sunday. A 
I can only do my part. And I will do it. Don't turn there. Just listen. In James chapter 5, verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. This cannot be religious prayers. This cannot be prayers that is prayed from a book. It has to be from an understanding of what prayer is in the first place and what are the, the principles that are in play for you to apply yourself to it and get results. Because notice, is anyone suffering? Let him pray. So the answer to the suffering is where? In praying. So if you're suffering and pray religious prayer, there will be no solution, no answer, no relief. So you're going to walk away from God because what is going to happen if you're praying religious prayer, the suffering is going to intensify. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Please pay attention to me. Look at me. I don't, don't look at nobody coming inside here. Look at me. I'm speaking to you. Don't be distracted. It says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms, hymns. And the psalms is in line with the word. Verse 14 says, is anyone among you sick? 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 I know even in this room, some of you are behaving as if I am the one that is making up stuff. That, that, that this is not really, you know, what God really wanted. And I don't see the need. Hold on to your ailments. Hold on to it. Because once a sickness or a disease or any kind of ailment exists in your body, it gives access to Satan. Because it's not coming from God. Therefore, it's coming from the devil. And if you hold on to it and receive it and continue to baby it, Satan has access to your body. And he's going to continue to work on that thing because that, it, that ailment or that sickness is not just going to be there and just remain as is. It's a loophole for Satan to come. And, if, and, and there are other things that he's now capable of bringing to your body once that thing remains. If it's allergy and you never get healing from that allergy, the allergy opens the door for more things to come to your body. You're not supposed to have no former ailment as a child of God. No former ailment in your body. No, no sickness, no pain, no disease, none. Is any sick among you? God put provision in place to counteract anything that Satan does. Why are we agreeing with Satan and resisting God? Why are we agreeing with Satan and resisting God? Satan, remember who Satan is. You, don't, you forget. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So if you're agreeing with him, what are you agreeing with? Debt. What are you agreeing with? Destruction. I am come, Jesus says, that you might have life. That life has no sickness in it. That life has no disease in it. That life has no form of ailment in it. Nothing. Is any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. They're elders of the church. And let them pray. Second time the word prayer is mentioned here. It said let them pray. So that means again... The results, the answer to the sickness is in the prayer that the elders would pray. Let them, the elders, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name, in the authority of the Lord, and the prayer of faith. 
I'm telling you there's a principle with the prayer. Notice the prayer of faith, principle, the prayer of faith will save. We are praying a lot of prayers that are not prayers of faith. Prayers of emotions. Prayers of our opinion, what we think we should pray, what we think we should say, because I believe that God will hear this if I say this. Jesus says, when you pray, do not pray like the heathen, because they think that they, shall be, that they will be heard because of their much words, you know, their much speaking. And a lot of us are doing it. I'm thinking that the length of time I pray, God must hear me. Nope. Nope. If it is not according to the principle that is given to you from God, he will not hear you. If he does, he's compromising his integrity. If he hears you outside of what he has given to you, he's compromising his integrity and he cannot do it. And the prior faith, notice, the prior faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. So in the process of praying, if this person die, God will raise them up from the dead. I found it rather strange, you know, when I say these things and think about it and even stood up to do it that the church would behave the way it did and I, sh I shouldn't be surprised because the church has been in a lost state for a long time we'll talk about it and we only spiritualize it Jesus did not only raise the spiritual dead he raised the physical, natural Lazarus wasn't spiritually dead Jairus' daughter was not spiritually dead the widow woman's son at Nain in Luke chapter 7 was not spiritually dead. They, they were dead, dead. And Jesus called Lazarus from the grave and he came out in his grave clothes. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Darkness was not spiritually dead. She was dead. And they heard that the apostle Peter was in the next city. They sent for him and they washed her body and put it upstairs. They didn't call the mug. They did not call the funeral home. They called the apostle. And when he came up and they told him and he went up, the Bible said he prayed and he turned to darkness. He turned to the body and he called her from the dead. She arose and he, he brought her down and presented her alive. When Paul was about to leave Ephesus after he stayed there for about three years, and he called the church together and he's preaching from the, from, the, from the evening or afternoon into the night. One person fell asleep, fell from the stories, died. Paul said, don't, don't, don't worry yourself. He went down, he laid over him, he raised him from the dead, bring him up back and he continued preaching until the next morning. Those words, spiritual dead. Because a lot of believers have even died and they did not fulfill their purpose. Satan took them out. They should have been brought back from the dead. But the deadness of the church, we simply have a funeral and give a eulogy and talk about how nice the person was. And they never fulfilled their purpose. Their purpose was never fulfilled, but we send them gone to heaven. I'm crazy, you see, I'm crazy. I'm making up stuff. And the prior of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins because of the act that that person take, God said they don't even have to confess the sin. The sins will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Notice where prayer holds the answer, holds the solution, and you that you may be healed. So now this is a different form of healing, right? Confess your trespasses, things that are undermining active sins and certain things that are undermining your, your walk in Christ, if you confess it, and the scripture says, whomever you're confessing it to, and they pray, you will experience healing. Once it is done in sincerity and truth, 
The, it, notice, it says that you may be healed. And then it goes on to say this now for you to understand that this is really so. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So there's a lot of things that we're struggling with. If we sincerely, truly come to someone that we know is in true connection with the Spirit and confess that thing and they pray, God is saying that you're going to be healed from it. You're going to be healed from that masturbation. You're going to be healed from that loss. You're going to be healed from that addiction. Immediately. Notice in verse 17. After saying what he said from verse 13, coming down to verse 16, you, you know, you're standing here and say, what is he talking about? What, 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 what? You are now saying, I can't do that. You are now saying, oh, you know, it's, it's those people that were in the Bible, you know, it's the prophets. They, they were the only righteous. Because I've heard, I have had people, not only here, but even in Jamaica, say, oh, there is no righteous man today on the earth. Only those who were in the Bible. If there is no righteous man today on the earth, how are the purposes of God are going to be fulfilled? If there is no righteous man in the earth, because God can't do anything out with, with a sinner, God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners until the moment that the sinner is going to repent. Truly repent. So it has to be righteous people that God used. And if there's no righteous man in the earth today, then my God, everything is over. Let us eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we all die and it's over. Notice now what the, script, what the Holy Spirit did through James. When you're now isolating yourself and say, oh, you know, Elijah and all of these persons, these prophets and these persons in the scripture and Jesus and all of that, I, we can never do that today. I can never pray for somebody and see their addiction immediately broken. I can never pray for somebody and see whatever certain things that they have been struggling with for years and bam, in a moment it's broken. Notice now, verse 17 says, Elijah Oh, we, we, we don't read this part about Elijah. We only read the part where he's calling down fire. We read the part where he raised the dead. We read the part where he did all of that. Wow. But notice it says Elijah. Elijah, who called down fire from heaven, was a man, watch this, with a nature like ours. So now you need to repent. Elijah that you read about starting in 1 Kings chapter 17. That's where we're introduced to him. We weren't told about which tribe he came from, who is his mother, who is his father. We just seem to show up and we're introduced to this man in power with all of these things. And now we are separating ourselves. He said, no, no, no. He was a man with a nature like ours. <laughs> Watch her, watch her, watch her. Elijah. Elijah. That when he told the servant to go and tell Ahab that it's going to rain, the Bible said he wrapped his clothing around him and, and, and up in his 80s, he outrun the chariot with the power of the Lord upon his life. That man had a nature like ours, prone to the same temptation, the same sin. But notice the scripture said, but he prayed earnestly. So now if you and I also pray earnestly, <laughs> stop doubting yourself. Stop doubting your prayers. That's why God has me talking about faith right now. What are we doing? He prayed earnestly, and notice there were specifics with the prayer. You can't just pray and just, uh, and just you know, uh, what do you want me to pray? Father, to pray for everything. There is specifics. Because if, if you don't pray specific prayer, uh, not even God can respond to it. You can't just pray and just, just pray, just pray for everything. 
Uh, there's a whole heap of stuff going on in my life. You do not see that in the scripture. When a person prays, there is a specific. And so you see a specific answer, a specific result. When Jesus is raising the dead, he didn't say, dead, come forth. There's a specific, if you want Lazarus to be risen from the dead, you call Lazarus. If you're going to raise Jairus' daughter, you go in the room, you put your shawl on the girl, and you say, damsel, you, that is under the prayer. Because God couldn't, Jesus couldn't say, girl, arise. He said, you, that is under the shawl, arise. Even sometimes when, so, when we say we are praying, we are all over the world. You need to be specific. Stop behaving like God an idiot and God no know where my do. I don't need to pray for everything in order for God to, re, re, to respond to it or do something about it. In the moment, the Spirit will even guide you how to pray. But we're not listening to the Spirit. We, we I, have to, I have to pray for the whole world. I have to pray for this. I have to pray for that because if I don't pray... Specific. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And what happened? What happened? And it notice what the scripture said. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Watch this now. After three years and six months, he go back to pray again. He's not all over the world. I pray again either. And after the three years and six months, and he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. When are we going to believe God? When are we going to believe the word? And stop thinking that you are so important. Because you're full of yourself, and all you're seeing is yourself. I can't, I, I, I. Get the high out of the way and give God room to show off himself through you. That's why we read about these persons. They took themselves out of the way and let God. Some of the prophets, they were fig pickers. They didn't start out as prophets. And when God appeared to them, they just took themselves out of the way. Say, okay, if you want me to use me, this is what I know. I'm a fig picker. You want to use me to be a prophet? Then go ahead. Some of them were sheep breathers. And if you're going to come down here now, please don't come on your emotion. Don't come just because I said what I said a while ago. Make sure you're really coming on the word. When Jesus said to Peter, come, Peter came on the word. And then after the wind and the wave got more boisterous, he started doubting the word. And what happened? He started sinking. Make sure the word gets inside of you. And you're acting upon the word. Take authority over the spirit of infirmity, the spirit of bondage, the spirit of oppression. I'm not asking you, devil. You know I'm not here to play with you. Jesus the Christ heals you. Take a minute and pray. Take a minute and pray. Based on the, what you hear from the word, pray from that. Believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because only the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, not a person trying to pray and, and hoping and wishing that God may hear. Approach God as a righteous person because you are if you are in Christ. Approach the throne with confidence. 
approach it with confidence, knowing that you have a right because of the blood of Jesus Christ to come. Come boldly. Come boldly to the throne of grace. You can't come wishy-washy. You can't come iffy-iffy. Come boldly. Talk to him. Talk to him. Whew. Mm. My God, my God, my God. Whew. May we receive your spirit, Father. May we receive your spirit. Many of us, the spirit is in us, but we have not received him. We're, we're, still, we're still all over the place. May we receive your spirit today. May we receive the spirit of the word. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. May we receive the spirit of the word. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for this opportunity. That you have given us to us one more time as we come together in this room. Father, it's not a social club. It's not a social gathering. Divine purpose, divine destiny, divine principles, divine order, divine context, Father, must be governing us coming together as your people, the church, the ecclesia of God. And so, Father, as we come together in this room, as we come together on our television, as we come together on our radio, as we come together on our computer, our tablets, our phone, as we come together, we come together, Father, we come together in the Spirit, we come together in the Word, with the Word. Father, let your kingdom come and let your will, let your will, let your will be done, be done, be done here on earth even as it is in heaven. Father, may we hear what your word said to us. Elijah was a man with, the, with a nature like ours. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. But he prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly that it should not rain on the land. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. He prayed again. Whew. Father, may we be willing to be stripped of religiosity. May we be willing to be stripped of religion. May we be willing to be stripped of the traditions of men, things that have been handed down. And we thought that it was of you and it was real and it was true. But when we check it in against the word, when we use the word to measure it, it falls short. It doesn't line up with who you are. So, Father, we are choosing to reject it. We're choosing to reject it. You said that we should test everything. We should test everything, test everything. And so, Father, as we test it, whatever is not in alignment with truth, we reject it. We reject it, Father, because only truth makes us free. Only truth guarantees us experiencing the life that Jesus came that we might have and have it more abundantly. Only truth. So, Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this privilege and this opportunity that we have been given to come together as your people. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we will experience that hope in heaven. We will experience angels ascending and descending. Father, thank you for what you have put in place for us to be a part of today as the church in the earth. Not only in this room, but wherever the church is, wherever the body of Christ is. Father, you know those who are yours. They have a 
seal upon them. They have a seal. They have a seal. You know them, Father. I pray that this day we will all be giving ourselves to your spirit and accomplishing your will being done here on earth. Even as it is already accomplished, it's already finished, it's already done, it's already established in the heaven. May we, Father, give ourselves to see it also be established on the earth as it is in heaven, 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 as it is in heaven. So, 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 so let it be done. So let it be done. So let it be done on earth, in earth, on earth. So let it be done. So let it be done. So let it be done. Father, thank you for hearing. Thank you for answering. Thank you for granting it. May the church be restored to the purposes of the living God. May we be delivered, be stripped of the cultures that we have taken on of the world. And so, Father, when we look at the church, we see the world in the church. We see the church in the church. The church, the church ought to be in the world, but not of it. Not of it. And the world is not supposed to be in the church. And so, Father, every plant that you did not plant, pull it up, root it up. Root it up. <laughs> Father, even if it costs us pain, even if it costs us grief, root it out. We want only what you plant. We want to bring forth the fruit of the kingdom. We want to bring forth the fruit that you are desiring the fruit that you are expecting you are the gardener your son is the true vine and you place us in him as branches that we should pull from the vine to bring forth the fruit that you're looking for and father even when we're bringing forth fruit you're not finished with us because every branch in you that bears fruit jesus you told us that the father prunes it because he wants more he wants more he wants more fruit. May we bring forth that fruit, Father. Not the fruit that man thinks that we should bring forth, but the fruit that you expect because you are the gardener and you are on purpose specifically. You're planting what you want. So, Father, may we not bring forth wild, wild grape, wild fruit. May we bring forth fruits that glorify you, glorifies you in the earth, glorifies you in the earth. That the word and your spirit have freedom to minister to us today, Father. Let your word and your spirit have freedom to minister to us today, Father. Let your word and your spirit have the freedom to minister to us. Riboko Shatarabasa. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated if you can, please. Righteousness is given to us through Christ, in Christ. Why do we keep on thinking that in order for me to be righteous, it's based on my works? 
And if you continue to believe that it's based on your works, when are you going to do enough work that will satisfy your, your expectation that I have done enough now so I am righteous? It will never happen. It will never happen. And therefore, God did not require you to be righteous based on your activities. It's based on his works. We are the workmanship of God in Christ Jesus. So God is the one that is doing the works. Even Jesus. Jesus exemplified it. Lest you would have thought that, you know, because he's Jesus and, you know, he said, no, the works that I do, they're not mine. I do nothing of myself. It's the Father. It's the Father. It's the Father that is doing the works. I do nothing of myself. That was set as an example for you and I to see what we ought to be giving ourselves to in Christ. We're always telling ourselves, I need to read more. I need to pray more. I need to spend more time with God. And we never, we never, we never come to a place where we accept that it's, it's enough. Because there are things happening, and when it happens now, the devil says, oh, it's because you haven't been reading much of late. You stopped reading as you used to a month ago or a week ago or a year ago. So now you... Come on, what are we doing? Do you think that God is waiting on you to read off 66 books before he does something through you? Do you think that God is waiting on you to do a 40-day fast and pray and pray and pray five times per day? Or maybe you need to add some more because the Muslims pray five times per day. And nobody's getting healed, nobody's getting delivered, nobody's being freed from their bondage because people are addicted, Muslims of addiction, Muslims of all kind of condition, yet they pray five times a day. Their prayer is religion, it's religious. Because they think that if they do and continue to practice that, then I'm a devoted Muslim. The Hindu do what they do to be a devoted Hindu. But who are they devoted to? Jesus tells us, don't pray like the heathens. Don't do it like the hypocrites. Follow my standard. Follow my principles. And you will always get results. Father, I know you always hear me. How many of us have that confidence? I know you always hear me, but because of the people that is standing here today, I am saying these things that they may know and believe that you sent me. So Jesus didn't have to say anything or pray to raise Lazarus from the dead. Wow. But because of the people standing right there, he said what he said so that they may know and believe. For us to do certain things, we think we have to pray down heaven first. But, but I didn't pray yet. Oh, but I didn't have my devotion yet. Satan will kill you if you keep that mindset.
on February the 10th, which was Saturday pass, this short video was sent to me by a sister here, Sister Perline, her niece in um, St. Vincent had a baby. Doctors give the baby two hours to live. She sent me the video and she said, Pastor, this is what's happening. The mother is at the hospital right now. If you notice, there's the baby string up. There's things in the nostril and stuff like that. And when she sent me the message and I listened and I heard what the Spirit said, I sent a voice note prior right away to them. And she sent it off to them and they played it. They heard it. Cut a long story short. This is Wednesday. The, all the things are now taken off the baby. <laughs> and then, yesterday, baby is now home. I am imploring us, please give God room to work in the earth again. Do not be a part of the messed up church. Don't be a part of the problem. Be a part of the solution. And God is not waiting on everybody. He's not waiting on everybody. There were certain things surrounding the birth of the baby and the, the doctors were saying that when the baby was born, the nurse, the nurse should have done this and they didn't do it. So hours passed. So now they're saying, we're giving the baby at least two hours. The baby, the, 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 the breathing, the breathing, they said it's supposed to be between 40 and 60 something. At that time, if you look at it, if you look at the videos, the, the baby is breathing. It's a hundred and something <gasps> because it's, it's grasping for breath. It's dying. And when I prayed by the following day, Sister Perlin said the, the, beats, the, the, the breathing was now down to 60 something and going down and come back down to its normal breathing. Stop doubting. Re resist doubt. Do not entertain it. Do not entertain it. Don't, do not doubt the Christ in you. You know what I want some of you to start doing? Even when you meet somebody on the road or you see somebody in the road and, and you know you see certain things or you have a conversation with them and you hear certain things before you tell them say I am I, I, I'm going to ask my pastor to pray for you offer to pray for them first and when you reach out to me you say pastor I met this person and all I, I'm, 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 I'm asking you to do is back up 10-4 but don't leave it that it's only pastor can pray. Yeah, there, there are certain things that, you know, because of the position that I'm in, uh, there are certain things that is on demand. But don't doubt yourself that in that moment, give yourself to God as a vessel. Because it's going to do something for you. It's going to do something for your faith. No, sir, me, only pastor can do this. John chapter 15 is the scripture that we're reading today. Two persons.
thank you, Father. Whew. Just realized that we we're going to read the scripture. I, I, I quoted from it. John chapter 15. Wow, pay attention to the word. There is um, 27 verses, so it's 13.5. So one person read 13 verse, verses, the other read the rest. So Brother Patrick, you read the first 13. Okay. John chapter 15. Go ahead, my brother. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every <laughs> branch that bears fruit, oh my God. he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abide in me, in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit. Wow. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified. Wow. <laughs> that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciple. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love if you keep my commandments. You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Ooh, wow. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love as no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friend. If you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. <laughs> you did not choose me. <laughs> But I chose you yes. mm. and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit <laughs> and that wow. your fruit should remain. Mm -hmm. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, mm -hmm. he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Mm -hmm. It's a command. That you love one another. It's, it's a, a command. command. Yes. If the world hates you, 
know that I hated, they hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. <laughs> Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you, I chose you mm -hmm. out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. <laughs> if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. Wow. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. Well, this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. <laughs> but when the helper comes, yes. But when the helper comes, mm -hmm. whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Because Amen. you have been with me mm -hmm. from the beginning. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Wow. 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 My, my, my. You notice how many times he said, you did not choose me. We need to get that. You did not choose me. You did not choose me. I chose you. I chose you. I chose you. You did not choose me. You did not choose me. So he's not here to serve you. You did not choose me. You did not choose me. I chose you. And if you're chosen, you're chosen for a purpose. And we need to serve that purpose. Need to serve that purpose. Someone sent me a, a question from the States uh, the other day. And I took a few days before I responded to it in thinking about it and allowing the scriptures to guide my response. And it's about passion. And I, I see where the world is worshiping passion and the church is also following suit. So yesterday we were in Indigo. Emmanuel got a, a, a card for his birthday. And so yesterday was PD day. So we decided to take him to Indigo for him to use his gift card. And while we're in the book section, um, looking at the different categories, fiction, non-fiction, science, da-da-da-da. And then I see business. So I walk over to the business area. And I see several books, you know, books written by persons that I see on television, see in the news and stuff like that. 
And then I notice this title. Find your passion first. And they're talking about startup business. Find your passion first. I look at it and I kiss my teeth in my mind. You know to kiss your teeth? <laughs> I did it in my mind and I said, nonsense. And that's why a lot of us are stuck. Because we're searching for passion. You'll never find passion until you find purpose. Passion doesn't give birth to purpose. Purpose gives birth to passion. You know why the zeal of the Lord was eating Jesus up? He didn't find the zeal of the Lord first. He submitted himself to the purposes of the Father, the will of the Father, and it produced that zeal. And so many, this nonsense that people are talking about, even some of these people that write these books, what they write, that's not how things work for them. Because you, you, you'll have, you know, Jeff Bezos, who is the founder of Amazon writing book. Be very careful how you read these people book. Steve Jobs writing book. And I don't know if you wrote any, but, you know, be careful. Because time and chance happen to these persons. What their business have become today, that, that was not their initial plan. Time and chance happen to them, as it says in Ecclesiastes. So be very careful. So now, because they have accomplished now, you know, they start to write books and they go on and giving talk and giving motivation. And say, Nonsense. They did not have any plan work out to accomplish what they have now accomplished. Time and chance. Time and chance happened to them. But you see, when you're in God, time and chance is not what guides you. The steps of a good man are ordered by who? So he's looking for passion. And in that same passage in Psalm 37, it said, The Lord will give you the desires of your heart. How did desire come about? They keep on telling you to look for your passion. <laughs> Have you found it yet? <laughs> Nonsense. Look for your purpose. What's your purpose? And a lot of you, when we talk about purpose now, you run off and thinking all kind of nonsense too. And I've been trying to allow you to see, and you need to look at me, look at me. What keeps me going from 1987 until now? How many years is that? I have not regressed. I have not stepped back. I keep going forward. And each day, the, the, the desire gets stronger. For 14 years, now almost 14 years, next month is 14 years, I've been standing in front of some of you. What have you seen? Have you seen any regression? That should say something to you. What, what, and, 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 and if you come and ask me what is my secret, what do you think I would tell you? Jesus discovers passion, right? <laughs> What, uh, what, what did Jesus say? When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came and sat upon him. That's where he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you notice, John was filled with the Holy Spirit from in his mother's womb, but Jesus was never filled with the Holy Spirit from in Mary's womb. Because John is not the one that is going to be the pattern son. John is not the one that is going to be our standard. Jesus. 
So because of John's assignment, God filled him with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. But Jesus was never filled from his mother's womb. When Jesus was baptized by John, after he came up out of the water, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit led him up into the wilderness. He returned in the power of the Spirit and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He didn't say, I discover my passion. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What passion did Adam have? It was the spirit of the Lord in him. So when Adam sinned, God said, my spirit cannot continue to abide in man. So God took the spirit. That's why we see people f- w- I look for passion out there. And then they find something to them and say, this is my passion. By next week, they move on to something else. David said, one thing of I desire of the Lord, one thing, and that will I seek after. How many, how many stuff some of you in this room have tried already? <laughs> how, how many things have you put your hand to? How many things, you know, and, and you keep moving, moving, moving? Because, because when you find the passion now, in a week the passion... So now you go looking for. Hmm. Do not follow the world, please. Don't do it. You, can't, you cannot be chosen by God and follow the world. You did not choose me. I chose you. I chose you. Wow. I chose you. I chose you. Do we understand that? We need to read these things and sit down with it for a week or a month until you get it. What does it look, what does it mean when he said that he chose you? What, what should that look like? In Canada, the system of government is um, what we know as a democratic system of government. So it's the people who really holds the power. So with that system of government, and and, and it's constituted as such, the people choose a central government. The central government being chosen by the people is for the benefit of the people. It's for the benefit of the people, right? So they choose their representative to represent them on the central government level, right? So the Minister of Education, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of the Minister of Education being chosen? Notice, Minister of Education. Education is always a problem in every nation. You're constantly seeing teachers striking because they're not getting enough pay and whatever. There's always problem with education. So if the education minister that is in power, the people now are expecting that the education minister, minister is going to fix the problem. And if it doesn't get fixed by this government, when election time comes now, what the people are going to think? We need to change the government, because this did not get fixed, even though they promised that they would have fixed it, they didn't, so we need a new government. And we see that continues. But I'm trying to show you something. So the Minister of Finance is there to take care of the... <laughs> the, minister, the, ministry, the Minister of Health. Wow, that's another big one. Canada have a serious... Health crisis. So, if God choose you, what did he choose you for? (laughs) What did he choose you for? Because a lot of you, you join church, you get baptized, but we are not in Christ. We don't know Christ and we don't represent the things of Christ. I chose you. You did not choose me. I chose you. So if you notice the government, the central government, 
they have to watch how they behave because if they want to be re-elected, they have to behave in a way that will give the people the confidence. Confidence. Because if the people lose confidence in the government, they're over. You did not choose me, I chose you. You did not choose me, I chose you. We're making up stuff. Even as I'm saying that, no, you're making up stuff. You did not choose me, I chose you. You know who was chosen? Jesus. Why did the Father choose him? And based on what the Father chose him for, should tell us something about us being chosen. Because we keep on talking about Jesus dying on the cross, but we forget who he was before he even died on the cross. Who he was continued after the cross. It didn't stop at the cross. When he came in time, who did he came in as? The Son of God. The Son of God died on the cross. The Son of God was buried. The Son of God rose from the dead. And we know that God the Father exerted all of his power to raise him from the dead. The Son of God rose from the dead. The Son of God ascended into heaven. And the Son of God said, I chose you. If he, the Son of God, chose you, who are you chosen to be? If you look at the scripture carefully, my father is the gardener. I am the true vine. So the pattern son is the true vine. If you are being placed in the sun as a branch, what fruit is supposed to come from you if, you're, if your branch is in, the, if you're in the vine, which is the sun, you're the branch, so you don't determine the fruit. It's the vine that determines it. Determine it. The branch is a... <laughs> So if the father plant a garden and implant the son as the vine, and you are inserted as branch, what, <laughs> what is supposed to come from you? What is, what, once you're in that vine now, you take on the sap, you take on the nature of the vine. Who do you become? What kind of fruit is the father looking for if he plants son vine? What kind of fruit is the father looking for if he plant S-O-N vine? And every branch in me that refused to be son, the father removes. Every branch in me that re refused to be a son, the father removes. And every branch in me that yields to be a son, the father prunes. You think that this is a joke thing that I've been preaching and I, I'm, I'm consistent. You notice I do, I'm not all over the place like preachers. Every Sunday morning they come up with a new message. Because this is, this is what it is. To go away from this is to be in a lost state. Every branch in me that refused to be a son, the father, not me, the, because the father is the gardener. It's the father's will. That matters here. He said he wants your fruit to remain. He wants your fruit to remain. He wants your fruit to remain. Not up all over the place. It must remain. In heaven right now, Jesus is the Son of God seated at the right hand of the Father. Our eternal status, our eternal position is to be a son. That's what started off creation. And that's what will end creation as we know it. God is not all over the place doing something new. He's consistent. That's why, that's why he's known as being faithful. 
He's not flippy, floppy. He's faithful. He's constant. He remained true to himself and to his word. You can rely on him. He's not going to be changing to the in and out. There is no shadow of turning in him. Father and Son, 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 Father and Son. He who hates me hates my Father also. That's what he said in verse 23. He who hates me. It's about father and son. Father and son. And the father set it up that you, if you're going to come to him, if you're going to know him, you have to come through the son. If you reject the son, you reject the father. You can't bypass the son and find the father. It's the son that introduced you to the father. So, oh, God no have no son. Until the Muslim repent, he's lost. Because they continue to tell us that we're blaspheming when we say that Allah have a son. Our Allah is not like your Allah. Don't mix we up. This, we didn't give him a son. He gave us. He gave us his son. <laughs> we didn't make him a father. He was father before anything was created. So you either accept it or reject it. And if you reject the son, you reject the father. He who hates me, hate my father also. He who hates me, hate my father also. So Muslim, you saying that God doesn't have a son? <laughs> <laughs> Your Allah don't have any. He's barren. He's impotent. But my God, the God of the Bible, he gave birth to a son before time began. And he introduced the creation to his son. As a matter of fact, creation was brought into being through the son. Without the son, nothing that was made was made. <laughs> In him was life. And the life was the light of all men coming into this world. He who hates me hates my father also. If you if I had not come, if I had not done among them the works which the Father did through him, which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated me and my Father. And my Father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which, which, which is written in their law. They hated me. Without a cause. So you know that people can hate you and people have hated you. That if you sit down to ask them why they hate you, they can't give you a proper explanation. They hate you without a cause. Because there is a spirit. There is a spirit that is at work to frustrate that. So don't try to argue with everybody. Just, just keep your eyes, keep your eyes on the Father. And fulfill the will of the Father. Because Jesus didn't go around and argue with everybody. They said he was a child of fornication. He didn't try to prove to them anything. He didn't try to prove anything to the devil. When the devil said, if you're the son of God, turn the stone into bread. If it was some of us, oh, quickly. We would try to show the devil that we have power. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. If you're the son of God, do this and I'll give you to this. Give you this. Oh, no. He knew who he was, so he didn't need to prove it. When you know who you are, you don't need to prove it. You're either 24 karat gold or your gold wash. <laughs> or fool's gold, as they call it. And if you are, you don't need to prove it. You are. 
I think we have a baby. Whew. I think we have a baby. I, I have to be holding myself here. I, I, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Oh, boy. Could set up something where we do these things differently. Outside of these things. Anyway. We have a baby here. The baby is here. Come, please. Baby dedication. Michael Alexander Laidley. Somebody was excited about the name. see, even what I'm going to continue to talk about with times and seasons in God, and I have been saying this for years now, and I don't know who have heard me. Not a lot of people hear me when I talk, because I talk strange. I talk very strange. Some don't even believe that I am of God. I was reading something yesterday in Jeremiah. And um, there were two prophets. There were many false prophets around Jeremiah during the time of Jeremiah prophesying. And there were two that specifically challenged Jeremiah. One of them, Jeremiah, when he came and was saying that what Jeremiah was saying, he was deceiving the people. He took the yoke from off Jeremiah's neck, was a wooden yoke, broke it and said, this is how God is going to set you free from the Babylonians. God says, because you have done that, it's now going to be a yoke of iron. Jeremiah prophesied that he would die in the same year. He died in the same year. And one of the things that they said about Jeremiah, that Jeremiah made himself a prophet. Jeremiah made himself a prophet. I've been saying this to you. Everything that is natural, God put the natural in place to show off Things of the spirit. Before birthing took place in the natural, birthing took place in the spirit. God had a son. I shouldn't have to tell you, but I need to say it. Don't think naturally. Because remember, God is spirit. So Christ is spirit. So Christ was birthed out of God. So the natural is meant to show off what has already happened in the spirit. And that's why God warned earthly fathers to bring up your children in the fear and what? The admonition of the Lord. And in order for a father to bring up his children in the fear of the Lord, he has to fear God first. The fear of God of genuinely governing your life. Because it's what you experience in God, you hand down to them. You bring down to them. You don't know God, they're not going to know God. You're playing with God, they're going to play with God. So there is a serious responsibility that is on the shoulder of men. And that's why we see in the world, the number one problem in the world. You'd never, you notice you never hear them reading, at, reading it on, in the news. They never talk about it. But it's, it is the number one problem. The number one problem is not the health crisis. It's not disease, it's not child trafficking, human trafficking, drugs trafficking. It's not auto theft. The number one problem in the world is fatherlessness. Because the reason why we have young people stealing cars, the reason why we have young people breaking into people's homes, the amount of breaking and enter that has been happening in, in Ontario, you know why we have young people, 14 year old, 15 year old. Yesterday they arrested a 14 year old girl that stabbed somebody in the subway area. And they found out that she's also connected to the murder. Look at me please, she's also connected to the murder of a street man. 
14 years old. 14 year old. Fatherlessness. And listen to me. Don't be fooled that because you're in the house, you're a father. Don't be fooled that because you're in the house, you're a father. That is the worst fatherlessness. Because you are there, but you are not there. And until we know God, we can never properly father our children. So the number one problem, the reason why we see a lot of the stuff that is playing out in the world. Fatherlessness. Children are angry, looking for an identity, so they give themselves over to do the things that they're doing. Are you paying attention to me, please? Are you listening to me? I'm not just here talking. Because that's why a lot of us, even that is in front of me, you continue to struggle with the idea of God being Father. When I started teaching this, many of you, the teaching that I have been teaching, you have never heard it before. Your pastor don't even touch on these things because they, 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 are, they are preserving themselves. They will never touch on certain things that I teach. Because if they do, it will make them look bad. And they're preserving themselves. I am not here to preserve myself. I am here to represent the Father. When I started teaching even on Father, many of you have been questioning, why would God make himself a Father? Why is God a Father? So we have not embraced God being a Father. Because when you hear the word Father, you are using your earthly father to interpret that. And your earthly father is a mess. Your earthly father has left a bitter taste in your mouth. So you don't want me to tell you that God is a father. No, pastor, tell me that God is God. Tell me that God is good. Tell me that God will bless me. Tell me that God loves me. But don't you tell me that he is a father. I'm going to keep on teaching it. And you will have no excuse when the Lord Jesus Christ returned that you didn't hear. The scripture says... In Matthew chapter 19, in verse 13, then little children, little children, they represent something, were brought to him, Jesus, that he might put his hands on them and pray. Again, prayer, not religious prayers he was going to pray. But the disciples rebuke the parents, stopping them. But Jesus said, let the little children come. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Wow. The nature of the little child, the innocence, the purity. Wow. They, they don't have the ability to malice. They don't have the ability to carry grudge. They don't have the ability to hold on to anything that was done to them previously wrong. They don't keep a book. They don't keep a record of the wrong done. You, you spank that child, you discipline that child, and in a minute, them running come here. Sometimes you have to say, no, 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 I'm not going to hug you now. You stay, because I need you to get the message <laughs> that you did something wrong. They completely forget that, and they're coming back. They don't hold on to anything. But we grew up, and we say we're adult. And we hold on to animosity for years. We hold on to earth. We hold on to, and we carrying it. And it burdening us down. And it sick us. But we still hold on. Because I'm going to revenge you. The kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, is like a little child. And you have to receive it as a little child. And you have to carry it with that nature. That purity, that, 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 that willingness and readiness and quick to forgive when something happened. Wow. That keeps you free. Forgiveness keeps you free. He says, and he laid his hands on them and departed 
from there. Hello. How are you? How is it going? You've been here for a little while now? How have it been since you came here? Hmm? Welcome to Earth. Welcome to this world. You have any regrets yet? <laughs> Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. The 17th day of February 2024. Wow. Thank you, Father. For this privilege and this opportunity to hold this child in my arms and to bless this child. Even as Jesus himself, the prophets, the apostles, children were brought to them for them to bless them. Not to baptize them, but bless them. Father, I thank you that you are the giver of life. You're the one who holds the blueprint for our life. Not when we were formed in our mother's womb, but before we were formed. Before we were formed. You hold the blueprint. If you didn't have it, we could not come in. If it didn't exist in you, we could not come in. And so, Father, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity of holding this child in my arm and it's reminding me of so many things and allowing me, Father, to see so many things that I am so appreciative of and I'm so grateful to know you as my God. Father, I ask you today that you will keep this child, preserve this child from sickness, preserve this child from disease, preserve this child from demonic influence, preserve this child from... Oh, Father, those who are not a part of this child's purpose and destiny, preserve this child. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that only those who are a part of this child's destiny and purpose that you will allow them to cross paths with this child. As we see throughout the scriptures, those who were a part of Samuel's destiny, those who are the persons who cross paths with him to guide him along the way for him to come into what he was destined to come into. Those who were a part of, the, of, the, of, the, of a part of Esther's life, you allow those persons to cross path with her, to bring her to the very kingdom, position her as a queen, that you know what would have happened years down the road, what would have come about, that she would have been in that position to... Oh, Father, to bring an end to what the wicked Amen had planned. Father, I thank you that purpose and destiny comes from you. Not the made of one that men who are in darkness think that they have to make up to give some kind of justification to their conscience and to their mind, but that which comes from you. Knowing, Father, that we were written in the book before we came into our mother's womb. So Father, I thank you that your spirit, your grace, your peace will surround this child's life and that this child will discover his purpose in life early. Father, we see so many examples in the scriptures, so many examples, so we know it's not impossible for you to do. So I ask you that that will be so. Preserve this child, Father, and I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that your kingdom come and your will be done where this child is concerned. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the Christ, so let it be, so let it be, so let it be. Michael Alexander Laidley. The Lord bless you. The Lord keeps you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. Cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Give you his peace all the days of your life in time. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the precious Holy Spirit. Amen. So be it. So be it.
So be it. <laughs> wow. Bless you. You're welcome. Bless you, sir. <laughs> I thought this was a show, then I never realized that. <laughs> How you do? You good? Bless you. Wow. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. So, I was kind of halting between two opinions. Where the teaching is concerned, that I started on Sunday. Would I continue it in the fasting meeting, or would I continue what I started? A few fastings are back. And there's something that is vitally important to this message. And if you notice, I am not all over the place with what I'm dispensing. They're all interconnected. <laughs> They're all interconnected. And this message that I started, um, it's a very strange one. It's a very strange one. I would even dare say all the messages that I release from the Spirit, they're strange. To the point where some of you don't believe what I'm saying. Some of you even act like you believe it, but you don't. And I'm not condemning you, it's the truth. Because the fruit is nowhere to be found. Because until you believe it, it cannot bear fruit. Until you believe it, it cannot bear the fruit that it is meant to bring forth. Until the seed is planted in the earth, no seed outside of the earth just grow on its own. Until the seed is planted in the earth, it cannot bring forth and produce as it ought. As it ought. Your spirit is the soil for the word of God. Your spirit is the soil for the word of God. Not your mind. Your spirit is the soil for the word of God. So there are things that the enemy does to stop your spirit from receiving the word of God. So he will mess with your mind from to stop you from receiving the word in your spirit. Because if your mind is confused, it can end what's supposed to be planted in your spirit. The word is supposed to bypass your mind and go into your spirit, spirit to spirit. God doesn't speak to your mind. Your mind is given for you. Your natural mind is given for you to use it in the natural. So you are in control of your mind. You use it when it's necessary. And you need to learn, you need to know when to shut it off and put it aside. And let your spirit, let your spirit be in control. Times and seasons in God. Why is this important? Why do I need to hear this? Why, why? Should I be concerned about this? Huh? Should I? Should you? Should I be talking about this? Should you be listening to me? <laughs> why? Why? Why?
Acts chapter 1. One of the main reasons why, it's because of what is written. Because of what is written. And what is written was spoken from God. The reason why you need to pay attention to certain things, because it's written. And what is written was spoken from God. Was spoken from God. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrines, for teaching. It is profitable for correction, correcting wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. Right? In Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through to 8, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles, the apostles, the apostles, whom he had chosen. Whom he had chosen. Jesus is still choosing apostles today. The majority of the present church that we see and know, they do not receive apostles from God anymore. There are so-called apostles out there, but the majority of them, they are false apostles. If they are false apostles, it means that they are agents of Satan. Because Satan has the power to transform himself into apostles. False apostles. And you have to understand, anytime Satan is doing that, it's because he knows that true apostles are necessary, are important to what God is doing in the earth. So therefore, he raises up the false. What is the intent of the false? To frustrate. To take away from what is true. So why, 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 why is it that Satan agents are transforming themselves into false apostles? Why, why are there false prophets? In order for you to understand what the false prophets are about, understand what the true prophet is. You know what the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2 and I think verse 19? The church, the church is supposed to operate on the foundation of apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the tr chief cornerstone. These are strange to people. People read the scriptures and push these things aside and never pay any attention to it. And if we don't get these things right, we will continue to delay the return of Christ. And now is the time to get it right. Now is the time to get it right. If we miss it now, after you're hearing it, if you miss it and continue to miss it, you're doomed. God will have no choice but to send you strong delusion. That you believe the lie for the truth. Because once you continue to on purpose rejecting the truth, <laughs> dementia is going to be your fate. Alzheimer is going to be your fate. Parkinson is going to be your fate. It's impossible for somebody that is living in truth, and truth is what's guiding your thought process for you to have dementia. No prophet in the scripture had dementia. None of the apostles had dementia. No person of God had such thing. To the apostles, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. 
being seen by the apostles during 40 days and speaking to the apostles of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Have you ever heard the word overarching? Overarching. If you look up the word, you will see what it means. Over the, oh, when you talk about the overarching, it is the most important thing. It is the thing that is connected to everything. It is the thing. It is the thing that is the most important holding everything together. Where the scriptures is concerned, what is the overarching theme of the scriptures? Because we go to the scripture and we make up a whole lot of stuff. We read the scripture and we come up with a whole lot of stuff. There are people who are still saying it up until today. That you can go to the Bible and find anything you want. You know it's true. But the question is, is it true? It's true that you can go there and find anything you want. But what you find there, is it true? Is it truth? Because the word context, context means that which, that which comes together to give meaning. Let me say that again. The word context means that which comes together to give meaning. So when the thing hasn't come together to give meaning, it's all over the place. And it leaves you in confusion. But when you have context, you have meaning. You have truth. You see what you can work with. You see where to go. You know exactly what needs to be done. When there is no context, there is no meaning. The word C-O-N, con. Yes. It means to weave. Weave together. Text is words. So every book is written in a context. Text is word. You notice text. When you text, what do you send? <laughs> words. Con weave together. So words being weave together to give meaning. People think that the Bible doesn't have any context to it. It does. There is a divine context. So it's the, the overarching theme of the scripture is what is supposed to determine how we interpret what we read. Let me say that again. The overarching theme, theme of the scripture is what is supposed to determine how we interpret what we read. That's why in 1 in, in Peter, is 1 Peter or 2 Peter? It says there is no private interpretation to the scriptures. There is no personal interpretation to the scripture because there is an overarching theme, theme. That is supposed to, so every single, every single believer on the face of the earth that believe in Christ should believe one thing. What? In this room, many beliefs, many opinions that even though I'm teaching and you come and present yourself in front of me, acting like you're hearing me, we are all over the place with what we believe. We know that it's possible for us to believe one thing. We know that it's possible for the hundreds and thousands of us to believe one thing because God did it. In the book of Acts, they were on, for you to have them on one accord, they are believing one thing. And then the church went rogue, and now we have over 45,000 denominations. Each denomination, for you to have 45,000 denominations, it's 45,000 different thinking. 
That's what bring about the denomination. Remember when Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter and James and John was with him. They saw Elijah and Moses appear to him, speaking to him concerning his suffering. And when the whole thing was finished and they saw what they saw, and the Bible said, Peter, not knowing what to say. When you don't know what to say, please learn this. When you don't know what to say, keep your trap. We love to talk to show off ourselves. I remember even in Jamaica, I used to take taxi. You have the public taxi and then you have those taxi that you can take privately. Sometimes even the public one, if you decide to go somewhere, you can hire them, charter them. And I would sit in that taxi from Port Antonio all the way to Ocho Reyes or Kingston and don't say a word. You don't need to talk all the time. And some, one of the best things that you can learn to do is to keep your mouth shut. He who keeps his mouth, Proverbs says, keeps his life. Because death and life is in the power of your tongue. So when you open your mouth to speak, the Bible says, whoever loves to use the tongue will eat the fruit of it. A lot of things happening in our life is because of our mouth. My words are very important to me. So therefore, I do not speak a lot. What is the main theme of the Bible? What is the main theme? Now I want your participation. What is the main theme of the Bible? She said the kingdom of God. He said God's kingdom. He said the kingdom of God. I said the kingdom of God. And we're saying it. But oh God, my concern is... Are you saying it just in front of me? But is it coming from your heart? Is it coming from the core of who you are? We were in a conversation the other day, and one of the person in the conversation made a statement, and up until today, I'm still thinking about it. And the person said, Oh, da da da, -da and, and Bobby come preach kingdom. And I believe the kingdom message, Bobby come preach kingdom. Bobby come preach kingdom. Bobby come preach kingdom. When you make a statement like that, Bobby come preach kingdom, it sounds like me. I'm me make it up. I made it up. And that's what many people have been saying for years. Once upon a time, I used to hear people say, oh, I hear, I, 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 I hear this guy from the Bahamas talking about the kingdom. You remember? And, 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 and there was a time when you go on YouTube and put in kingdom, the only person I used to see come up was Miles Monroe. He died how many years now? Was it 2014, 20, somewhere there he died? But many years. No, after, you notice, after he died, if you still search, you will still get a lot of his videos coming up. But it's like many places who used to even invite him to come in. And it's only when he come in, the message of the kingdom would be preached in their, in their place. Outside of that, the, 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 the home pastor doesn't teach and preach the kingdom. Because they don't believe that it is important. They don't believe that the kingdom of God is present today. They don't believe that the kingdom of God has anything to do with our life today. They only think of the kingdom as something coming. Okay. Look at me and listen to me very carefully today. Let's, 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 let's sit on that premise for a little. If that was true... That the kingdom of God is not here now. When we talk about the kingdom of God, you're talking about the rule of God. So if it's not here, it means that God is not ruling right now. <laughs> and if God is not ruling right now, who is ruling? Because there's no middle ground. 
some of your answer, you need to think before you answer. Because when I say, if God is not ruling right now, who is ruling? You say, Satan. So it's just Satan ruling. If it's just Satan ruling, and of course he's ruling. And if it's just Satan ruling, whoa, whoa. How is it going to end? Satan is ruling, yes, but Satan is only ruling where he's permitted. Because even if Satan is ruling in your life, you gave him the permit. You stamp it and sign off on it. The Bible, my God, tell me, give no place to the devil. So I will never give him a permit to operate in my life. He can operate around me. And where, wherever he's operating around me, they gave him a permit. We know the first human to give him a permit in the earth. Because he came in the earth, but he could. Watch here. He would have been in the earth and couldn't touch anything. He would have been in the earth and could not touch anything. Satan could not touch anything until Adam gave him the Adam gave him the permit and signed it. And that's why when God said to him in Job, where are you coming from? He said, I am coming. I, don't you know that I'm up and down, to and fro throughout all the earth? Who gave him permit? Adam Adam, if they had not agreed with him, he would be in the earth and could not touch anything. I said, if they had not given him a permit, Satan can come around you, going about like a roaring lion, but he can't touch you until you give him permission. And he gives you permission, you give him permission when you believe his lies. Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira, why have you agreed? Why have you agreed to lie to God? It wasn't an accident. It's not a coincidence. Why have you agreed to lie to God? It was done on purpose. And notice, God didn't kill them just for the sake. God is not unjust and he's not unfair. It was a justified killing because they on purpose planned to lie. They could have sold the land. Listen to me. They could have sold the land for one million dollars and decide to give God a penny. And it would not be a problem if that was the truth. We sold the land for a million dollars, but we're giving you a penny. No problem. They said, we sold the land for this much, and we're giving you. We're giving it to you. That was not what they sold the land for. Sometimes we treat God like God is just slack, you know. That's why a lot of your life, your life is showing off what you think about God. Your life is showing off what you think about God. Do you know that people think that God showed favoritism in accepting Abel's offering and rejecting Cain's offering? And I hear preachers say, look at nonsense. When are we going to let the Spirit speak to us and stop using our carnal mind to interpret the Scriptures? For God to judge, for God to reject, notice, for God to reject Cain offering. When you reject something, there is a standard. When you reject something, there is a standard. I remember the first time. I could do it, do, do it with my passport, but let me go with the visa. The first time I'm applying for a visa to come to Canada, leave the United States out of it, because I went there, what, eight times, and they didn't, they didn't <laughs> like me at that time. But the first time I'm applying to come to Canada for a visa, 
I remember that time, I know a lot of changes. Like every year, sometimes all two, three changes take place in the whole system of how things is done. At that time, I remember you get the application, you had to pay the visa fee through the Scotia Bank and get the receipt from the bank and bring it in to the embassy with your application to show that you pay. And you were told clearly that there it's non-refundable. <laughs> so whether or not your application is approved or not, kiss you money goodbye <laughs> and they tell you in the writing and when you sign the document you're signing to that so you can't even sue them on the application there are certain requirements there are certain requirements first your name your legal name and the name that they're looking for in the application is the name that is in your passport exactly as it is in your passport so you write that in, you fill that out. Then your address. And you put your address. And then after you go down now, what your purpose of traveling to Canada. So when you put in that, you must now have documents to support the purpose of your travel. That's what they're looking for. So many times people put in application and the application is denied. It's that what the officer is looking for is not there to support what you have on the application. Therefore, they have no other choice but to deny the application. I'm showing you something here now. They have a requirement for you to get a visa to come to the country. And it starts with the application. So once you put in all the necessary information, and at the end of it, when you finish this, Kim, you don't know nothing when we talk about me, dear, because you never apply for no <laughs> Canadian visa. Eh? <laughs> but at the end of the application, my dear sister, it, there's a writing there that you really say, I am signing to say that all the information that I have given above is the truth because to lie to an immigration officer, to lie to immigration, it's against the law. And if they catch you lying, you can be denied entry into the country for years to come. But you know we lie. People still lie. <laughs> anyway, once you meet the requirements, and the officer get that application and they look, and they look, the first thing they look at is not the documents that you, the, the accompany documents that you put in there. The first thing they're looking at is the application. And they're going through and they're checking. So as they go through now and they look, they go through and they look, supporting documents, okay. They go down and they go down and require that you produce your bank statement. And they also told you what amount of money <laughs> are you want coming at them country, you know? So you have to meet their requirement. They're telling you the amount of money that you're supposed to have in your account in order for them to grant you entry into their country. So you must produce. And they say to you that you bring, they bring a photocopy of the document on the, on the day of submitting the application. But when you're returning for the interview, you must have the original documents with you. Because you can't go borrow somebody bank. <laughs> You can borrow somebody. So when you come with the original documents, it has to line up with what the photocopy is. Because photocopy, you can do a lot of things with it. But the original? Once you meet the requirement, they stamp off on it. It is a possibility. They still have the power that even when you meet all the requirements, they can still deny you. But you're hoping now that you meet all the requirements that they're re requesting of you, and therefore you will get approved. And then you come out and you say, me get the thing! <laughs> all of that now, come back to Cain. 
Why did God reject Cain's offering and accept Abel's offering? Was it left to Abel to offer to God anything he thinks that God wanted? If God accepts Cain, if God accepts Abel's offering, it means that Abel had the supporting documents. And God say, yes, yes. And when God look at Cain, it does not line up. What was Cain, what was, what was Abel's offering? The Bible said Abel was a keeper of sheep. So when, Cable, when Abel offered to God an offering, what was the offering? It was an offering of animal that was now killed. Blood was offered. So if Cain did not have any offering of that sort, what should Cain have done? What should he do? His brother has what God requires. It's not that he could not do it. His brother has what God requires. So what should he have done? So notice, when God accepted his brother's offering and rejected it, he came before God with a frown on his face. And God said, why are you looking like that? Notice, God was even helping him. God says, sin lies at your door. Sin cannot come in until there is a standard. And God said to him, sin lies at your door and it desire is for you. But you must rule over it. You must rule over it. Go and correct what you have done wrong. If he had gone and took, watch this, and even, even to trade, because we know early how it all started out. It never started out with money as we know it today. What, was, what used to be done is that if you have a need for a lamb, a sheep, and I am a farmer that only plant cane, so what do I do? I come to Brother West with my cane and make a trade. And get the lamb and go and offer it to God. Instead of going and correcting it, he got what? He was already so offended with his brother that instead of going to his brother and say, get, let me get one of your lamb to offer to the Lord. He went and did what? Murdered his brother. And that's why in the book of First John, he said, do not be like Cain. Do not be like Cain. Who murders his brother because his brother's works were righteous and his was not. And if you notice, when we, when we see people that are doing right, instead of even getting in alignment with them and ask, you know, how can I do? We hate, we hate them, we attack them because we want to make ourselves look good. We vilify them. Pharisaical spirit. The Saul spirit. Rather than taking David under your arm and fathering David and know that you're preparing the next king, you envy him and want to kill him. You're competing. We see God using somebody and they're, they, in your eyes, they're getting more fame than you. They're getting more puppy, popularity than you. Rather than being up, know that we're working for one. We're, work, we're, we're, we're doing, what are we doing? So we misconstrued what the person is saying. And with everything, because we have something, we have something. Sin lies at the door, Cain. And its desire is for you. But you must rule over it. To rule over sin is to correct the wrong. Father, help me. 
you are helping me. Thank you for helping me. We're reading these scriptures for so long and we keep missing it. Jesus Christ, when he came on the scene teaching and preaching, his central message was about the kingdom of God. He died as a king, buried as a king, rose from the dead as a king. And when he rose from the dead, he met with the apostles and the last 40 days on earth in his resurrected body before he ascended into heaven, he continued to speak to them of the things pertaining to. Don't just look at me. Look at, look, that's what's in your Bible? That's what's written in your Bible? Am I making it up? Am I trying to push something on you that God doesn't want you to hear or for you to receive? Isn't that what's written there? Is that what's in your Bible? Because you have a Canadian Bible, right? And I'm reading a Bible from Jamaica. It's not in your Bible, right? Because it's Canadian version, right? Does it say that at the ending of verse 3? Speaking and speaking and speaking of the things speaking of the things and he didn't say he spoke things he didn't say he spoke a lot of things to them he didn't say that he spoke of many things to them and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of god the church has lost, I, I, I was going to say the church have lost it. The church did not have the concept. The present church did not get the concept of the kingdom. So therefore we didn't lose it and we don't have it and we don't care to have it either. So when Miles Monroe passed, many places where there would be a sound of it, it became... There are ministries in Canada that used to invite him up every year for even two nights or three nights of weekend meetings. There was a particular church in Hamilton. I remember hearing that. They, they would invite him a lot of times. Once Miles died, these pastors go back. They went right back to their old way of thinking. And the people in those congregations no longer hear any consistent message about the kingdom of God. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he spent three days and three nights in the earth. So during those three days and three nights, nobody's preaching the kingdom. Because before he came preaching it, only John was preaching it for, watch this, for the purpose of preparing the way for the king to come. The moment, watch this, the moment John died, there was not a silence. The very moment Jesus heard that John the Baptist died. You remember what the scripture said? Jesus be gone. But when Jesus died for three days and three nights, no kingdom message being preached. Three days and three nights, no kingdom message. Fear, uncertainty. Is this really the one that we were expecting? We watched him die. Their minds is all over the place. But when Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus spent 40 days with them and bring them back in alignment. He said, you can't be thinking all kinds of things and thinking that this is over because I died. No, I'm alive. And I will never die again. And once you hear me and receive this, it will continue until I return the second time. Because the spirit is not going to come. And see to it that there is a continuation and an advancement of the kingdom until the day he returns. Where the kingdom message is silence, it's not because God is not speaking it but because we are deaf. And we are rebellious. The 
Many people come. Many people come here. And when you invite even some people come in, I'm talking about kingdom, they have no interest in it. Because they come here and it's the first some of them hearing it. And so it's only that man at that little place in the schoolroom running off his mouth talking. Because they go out there and wherever they were going before, wherever their mother introduced them to, wherever their grandparents introduced them to, it's entertainment that they're getting. Because our churches today is about entertainment. It's not about carrying the interests of God in the earth. So even parents go to churches, it's not that they care about God's word. It's because the church have a good children program. So I like that church. They have some good programs here for children. Notice, you know, I like that church because they have some good programs there for children and you work from Monday to Saturday or Friday so you want a little break for the for the day in between so you bring the pit to them go dump them in the program and sit down in the meeting and sleep and they're they're entertaining you with praise and worship that doesn't worship God and doesn't praise God it's only entertaining you no wonder God lead me in a part and say cut you out and a lot of you upset, and some of you still have struggle because we not sing. But the, are, are you hearing the word? Are you hearing the word? It's not about the singing. Jesus did not speak with them about singing for 40 days. He spoke to them of the things concerning the kingdom of God. He didn't give them how to start a church. He didn't say, this is how you need to, you know, go and structure your, your business where a church is concerned. He didn't have a church conference with them. For 40 days, he spoke to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's what matters. Because it is the context that everything is the context that everything is brought together by. When we approach the Bible without a clear concept of the kingdom, you will end up in trouble with your interpretation and how you go about reading the scriptures. You will. It's a must. It's impossible for you not to go, of course. You wonder why certain things come out? It's because I am staying within context. Once you're getting the teaching of the kingdom, it's impossible for you to miss God as Father. It's impossible for you to miss your sonship. Because the kingdom of God targets you with the fatherhood of God. It targets you. With, it it demands. It put a demand on you to come into sonship. This, the readings that we're reading, how father and son, father, my father, my father, the father, my father, my father, the father, my father, the father. I am the true vine, and hear what he says, and my father is the vine dresser. So he's the one that, notice you know, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. So my father is the one that takes care of the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, the father removes them. I pray God you're not removed. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And for you not to bear fruit, it's not an accident. For you not to bear fruit, it's, it's deliberate. It's rebellion on your part. You have a choice in it. And every branch that bear fruit, you do not bear fruit automatically either. It's not an accident or coincidence. You have to on purpose choose to be Whatever denomination or church or wherever you were a part of before, you choose. You chose to be there. Until some of you got fed up with church. Some of you were staying home. 
And didn't want to have anything to do with church. I know like even Marjorie, when I heard Marjorie share her testimony, she didn't, she weren't going anywhere. And when somebody came and told her about this place and told her about this, place, she kept on putting it off, kept on, but the person kept on. Kept, and you know what I noticed? A lot of persons who bring people to the ministry, we don't know where they're there today. Then Ghana, England, then Ghana, Africa, then Ghana, then Ghana, Timbuktu, then Ghana, give me a bit. We don't know where they're there. It's as if their reason, their purpose of coming in contact with the ministry was to connect you and then disappear. I pray God that you do not take it for granted. I pray God that you do not. I pray God that you do not take it for granted. I pray God that you do not take it for granted. Bobby, come preach in kingdom. Many preachers did not preach and is not, did not preach a kingdom because they said, oh, it's Miles Monroe. Oh, that guy from the Bahamas. Because, you know, he's the one who discovered it. He's the one who developed it. It's his formula. It's, it's, it's his pattern. So, you know, we have, to, we have to be careful because we don't want to infringe. Because there is law against such, you know. So they stay away from it. I mean, he was the only one talking about it. He was the only one writing books about it. He was the only one that was known. And God says, I'm going to remove him. Because it's not his. It's mine. And when he's gone, and even though you're not hearing it, it's written. When he's gone and you're not hearing it, you still will be judged. You will not escape because it's written. And every time you take up the Bible to read it, the overarching theme of the scripture from Genesis to Revelation is the kingdom of God. Even in the Revelation during the time of the tribulation, the Bible said there will be an angel that flying across the year. And here it is with the everlasting gospel. I never did that before. I never got stuck at that verse before like that. I've emphasized on it, yes, but not like that. There's something about this today. The ministry in Jamaica started on the teachings of the kingdom. They, they walk away from it, and that's why the ministry in Jamaica. And guess what? They won't blame me, no? And then think some here, idiot. You think I'm going to take the blame for what is happening in Jamaica? I, I do. I, it really bothers me. I carry the burden and all that. But I will not take the blame. I will not let the Cain spirit get away with blaming me. I left. I left enough teaching for them to continue and build on it. They walked away from it. And it's evident that they did not receive it. It's evident that they still thought it was Bobby's message. And during the time that I was able to go back, every time I go back, that's what I consistently stayed with. That was, the, that was always the central theme. That doesn't matter what I'm talking about. Because if you notice, the name says something about the very ministry. It's not just a name to register with the government. It's, there's a me we, our, our name must have a message in it that when people hear it, even if they don't think about it, they are already facing judgment. Kingdom living. Kingdom. You're, you're in trouble. You were in the embassy. <laughs> and you graduate from the embassy. And after you get, you, watch this, after you get approved in the embassy, you're supposed to continue in the living because the embassy is meant to bring you into a country. Because the embassy is representing a country. So once you come to the embassy and the embassy approve you. And you have access to the country. You're supposed to develop the culture of the country that the embassy is representing. So now the embassy approve you for what? 
kingdom living. <laughs> and once you get approved, you don't need to stay in the embassy. The things that happen with this ministry, everything holds a message in it. We started out the ministry in Jamaica under the name Faith Warriors of Christ. Up until now, still some, some of them still not let you go and still defend Faith Warriors of Christ. And God said, no, you started out this because of certain things that was going on. Now you're at this place, based on growth and maturity, a shift needs to take place. Dispensation, dispensations, changes, but God does not change. And when the dispensation change, you need to change with it. When the time change, you need to change with it. When the season change, you need to change with it. Many of us are stuck in time. And being assembled together with them in verse 4. Can you imagine it's just verse 3? I had reached and all of that come out. And being assembled together with them, the apostles, he commanded them, the apostles, not to depart from Jerusalem. He commanded them, the apostles, not to depart from Jerusalem. He commanded them, the apostles, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. We have been, we have been working hard from 2020 to our last year, we are working hard for move from square one. <laughs> I mean, we are working hard, you know. We are look at property and we are look and we are plan. And God said, no, 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 no. I'm not finished with you at square one. It doesn't matter even if you're having a, 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 a whatever and you can't find space to put people and people can't come in or whatever. It no matter, it no matter who wants to stay there in the yard and say, well, me now I'm go because no space. No, there. The, there's a message at square one that we need to get because we have been all over the place even though God started out with us at church and Kennedy. And he wanted us to come into an understanding of certain things. We, he says, okay, now you're at advance. Because you can't stay at church and Kennedy. You need to advance. Advance, we decide to advance, but not with what he intended for us to advance with. And we reach midway. We reach midway and he said, no, 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 no. You're not supposed to stay at midway either, but you're supposed to be advancing and midway. Now you're supposed to still be carrying something that is of the truth. Then he bring us and put us in orbit. <laughs> that at least we stop and think. So that when we touch down, we know exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We still never get it. So I'm saying, all right, I'm going to bring you right back to square one. Literally bring you to a place called Square One. And we think we're here to have church. Stop and think. Square One is where you go back to rethink. Square One is where you go back to learn from your mistakes so that when you move out again, you do not continue to repeat the mistakes. Square One is also a place where you start over Again, but this time you're starting over with certain knowledge, with certain wisdom, with certain strength, with certain understanding. So when he moves us, and I'm really excited to see the name of the place where we're going to move from, from anytime we move, you know. Whether it's this year or next year or whatever, me not focus on that right you now. I'm paying attention to make sure that we get it. Because Israel didn't get it. God said, one more year. You got it? No, they didn't. They're still quarreling, murmuring. One more year. And it turned into 40 years. And they still didn't get it. God said, every single one of you that came out of Egypt, your body, your carcass will fall in the wilderness. Only those who were born in the wilderness except two, Caleb and Joshua, that came out of Egypt, will enter the promised land. Amen. 
Is this Bobby's message? Is this Bobby's thinking? Is this Bobby's making? Is this Bobby's plan? Or is this the divine order before time? And not because you're alone in the thing doesn't mean that it's not true. Because today's world, what we define as being the truth is based on how many people like it. How many people review it. Because today we're living in a world that we shop no longer based upon our choosing. We shop based on others' reviews. Because the platform set that way, that they actually, notice, when you buy something online, the next thing that follows is an email for you to review. For, to <laughs> Even before you get the thing they send you for you to, and many times I say, but me not get the product, how can I review something that I have not yet used and understand what it is and how it benefits me? And we're asking you to give it a five star. As soon as you talk to customer service, whether it's Bell or Rogers or whoever, you either get it in the form of a text or an email about the person's dealings with you. From one to five, how friendly was, <laughs> was the person? Did you understand clearly what they were saying? Were they knowledgeable? And after you finish all of that, now you come down and you say, from one to five or from one to ten, depends on which scale they're using. How likely are you to recommend Rogers to your friends and family? <laughs> two. And if you ever go press two, one whole heap of sitting open up for you to tell them why. I don't, I don't, and they're telling you it's, it's just, just a minute. Sometimes I'll 10, 15 minutes, I'll me just stop it sometimes. Sometimes I stop it halfway and close it. I say, go about your business. I don't have no time for it. I tell them, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you imagine if after every meeting, God send you an email. <laughs> <laughs> We want to know, you know, how heaven is serving you and how uh, efficient we are and, you know, the Holy Spirit. So on the Holy Spirit from one to five, how we degrade how the Holy Spirit dealt with you today. <laughs> and we want to improve on business here in heaven and to make sure, you know, that you're satisfied with our service. Oh, my goodness. Not because you're alone believing the thing doesn't mean that it's not true. Let me say that again. Not because you're alone believing something doesn't mean that it's not true. Can I come over this side? Although we're in the same room. Not because you're alone believing something doesn't mean that it's not true. That is one of the price I have paid over the years. Many times it seemed like I am the only one believing these things. I know I am not, but many times it would appear as that way. And many people today, even in the body of Christ, they are quick to go with the crowd because it must be that something true and good is happening. Because look, look, look at the amount of people. And look at how many people you have. The Gideon 300. Going against 135,000. And they started out with 22. Gideon started out with 22,000. And not Gideon, because if it was up to Gideon, he would have never sent anybody home. God said, come here, Gideon. He said, I want you to make an announcement. He said, the people are too much. Gideon said, I think you need to come a little closer. <laughs> 
because the distance from where you're looking at, it's, it's affecting how you're seeing things. You're coming a little closer. <laughs> God said, no, 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 they're too much. And if I give you the victory with that amount of people, they're going to think that it's because of their number why they got the victory. He said, I want you to make an announcement. Anyone that is fearful, go home. And in Gideon mind, I'm thinking about maybe one or five. Because I was watching that little one round of the corner there. Him look like him want to go back home a long time. You know how much, you know much go home? <laughs> 22,000 years, right? You know how much go home? 10,000 remain. When he say, those of you that are fearful, go back home. 10,000 remain. How much go home? 12, five. all of a sudden Gideon just see people as a line up on a God. He said, no, sir. He said, God, no, 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 no. This is over. Forget it, God. <laughs> because I'm thinking it was only five that was going to go home. And Gideon said, you sure? You sure you're fearful? You sure you don't want to stay? He said, no, no. <laughs> and then when the 10,000 remain, God said, there's still, God said, there's still too many. No, 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 no. God said, I want you to bring them down to the water brook. And I will, I, God, will test them there. The ones that lap like dogs. So that means Gideon after watching them carefully. He said, the one that laps like a dog, separate them. You know dog lap. You ever watch a dog? While they're lapping, they're looking. They're not just a drink. On a, they're, they're looking around. And the ones that went, then just hold their head down and a drink. So the enemy could come and cut off you and you're still a drink. And when you get up back, you realize so your head down, there's still a drink. But, and Gideon said, I'm sure all of these guys are going to be passing the test with flying colors. When he finished separating, only 300. So out of the 10,000, only 300 remain. And God said, you're not going to use a sword. You're not going to use any weapon. A pitcher, a lamp, and a trumpet. Or you're going to war with the, uh, the enemy of spear, sword, bow and arrow, chariot, horse, and you have pitcher, lantern, and trumpet. Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> pitcher. Lantern, trumpet. Those are not weapons for war. Pitcher, you carry water in there. You put water in there, right? Lantern, it's a light that you use to see in the dark. Trumpet, play music. And Gideon said to them, watch me. Whatever you see me do, do it. That's a leader. Whatever you see me do, do it. I said, that's a leader. Whatever you see me do, do it. That's a leader. <laughs> Anything that you as a parent doing, our parents doing, and you don't think that your child should do it, you should never do it. Mm -hmm, no. So if you think that they're not supposed to smoke, why send them to buy the cigarette for you? Why send them to go and light it? And then when they do, you say, don't let me catch you smoking. Go on. It's what they see. They do. And that's why God set the leaders in the way that he does in front of Israel and where the present church is concerned. But today the church doesn't believe that they should have leaders that are leading them in holiness and righteousness. We need leaders that are human like us. And they can identify with all our pains and stuff like that and come and talk about their pain all the time and talk about their weakness and say, you know, last night I went to a motel with a woman. You know, I'm human. Okay, pastor, we will pray for you. <laughs> oh, yes, pastor. I don't care what happened. I'm going to follow him because we're all human.
We want a pastor that have a lot of extramarital affairs because he's human. And it's very hard for him to keep his zipper up. I can't follow a man that never make a mistake. I can't follow a man that can't identify with my weaknesses. I'm coming from there. God doesn't intend for the leader to stay in weakness. The leader is supposed to be an example for you to follow. Paul said, we are a pattern. We are a pattern for you to follow. If we're all weak, how we, what, what, what do you think is going to happen? I'm weak, you're weak. We're waiting down here by the river. Will you come, Lord Jesus? Satan don't want we fi cross. Oh, Satan don't want we fi cross. <laughs> if you don't come to our rescue, I'll be lost. You want a leader that in the midst of whatever, standing strong, standing faithful, standing firm, it gives you hope. It lets you know that you can get up and you can go on and you can keep moving forward. Because if my leader can do it and it's the God that I am trusting, it's the same God that my leader is trusting. So therefore, I too can make it. We cherish our weakness. We love our weakness. We sing song about it. And we continue to have pity party. I love it. And we never want to move. Because this is, this is not nice. I can, oh. Don't move the mountain that I have to climb. Just give me the strength there, Lord, and I will climb it and show the world that I can climb it. God not call you to be a mountain climber. He calls you to be a mountain mover. So he's not going to give you no strength to climb the mountain. Jesus said, speak to the mountain and tell it to do what? I'm only human. I'm just a woman or, or man, which depends on who was singing. Because me or man, I sing it and when they reach, I say, no, I'm just a woman. I'm a look around and say, but. <laughs> because it's a woman who wrote the song and sing the song. So the woman says, I'm just a human. I'm only a human. You know, I'm just a woman. Lord, help me to that. So all when men are singing it, they must say, I'm just a woman. Be careful. <laughs> but look, notice the song. Lord, help me today. Show me the way one day at a time. It sounds good, but there is something very subtle and deceptive in the song. Notice how the song starts out. I am only human. When you're born again, you have been delivered from being only a human. And a lot of people for years in the church have problem with me because I'm too strong. I'm too confident. Come on, you need to come down to earth and you need to identify yourself with people. If you don't have somebody out there that you can look at to give you hope, every Halloween are the same pot. And like crabs, the crab spirit, you put 10 crabs in a pot, not one come out. Because as soon as one, you know, reach up and hook up and go up, the other one pull him down. And it never come out. We're not crabs. Mm, my God. Verse 5, I think I reach. For John truly baptized 
I need to stop somewhere soon. For John truly baptized you with water. John truly baptized you with water. But you, John truly baptized you with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's, there's not an option here. If you think that there is an option, you disqualify yourself from life in the kingdom. Let me say that again. Being baptized with the Holy Spirit is not an option. And if you think that there is an option, you have disqualified yourself from life in the kingdom. I am not saying that. That's what's in the word. Because the kingdom is in the Holy Spirit. So if you avoid the Holy Spirit, you are also voiding the kingdom. Central to your understanding of the kingdom is the Holy Spirit. Central to your experience in the kingdom is the Holy Spirit. Central to your purpose being fulfilled in the kingdom is the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus is saying these things to them. For you and I to read and learn from it and realize this is also for me today. John truly baptized you. I truly baptized you in water. Last month I baptized 38 of you. January, I baptized 28 of you. I did, didn't I baptize you in water? Wasn't it water? It wasn't oil. It wasn't cream. It was water, right? I baptized you in water, but it's not, that's not the end of the story. That baptism should trigger desire for another baptism. And some people get the baptism in the Holy Spirit even before they get baptized in water. It depends on how open they are. We're taking these things too lightly, people. And that's why we're, light. we're living light. John truly baptized you with water. But you shall be, you shall be, not maybe, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. And I'm going to prophesy that for somebody in this room today. Not many, those of you that are not baptized yet, not many days from now. Some of us are speaking in tongues, but we have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. The tongues are coming from an emotional place. Not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, why did they do it? Because Jesus told them to, right? He's speaking to them and he's ordering some things and putting some things together. When they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? You see, if you notice, they were kingdom oriented, unlike us. But the thing here, the only problem here is that they were thinking of the wrong kingdom. But they were kingdom minded. So they said, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father had put in his own power. Did you see that? Did you see that again? It's not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the father had put in his own. Every time I come... I am thinking that this is the day that I'm going to finish this and move on to the next level. But I know that I'm not going to end this today. So now, a few more minutes, let us go to something to continue to build on this. Times and seasons, the end of all things is at hand. You know I didn't make that up, right? You know I took that from the scripture, right? You sure? That's in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, I think. But the end of all things is at hand. Notice. Notice. Where is it? You can't see nothing. But when it come on here, this light knock it out. You see it? 
it only shows where the block is. Notice it. It says the end. But, but, but notice here, all. You think that God knows what he's saying? Do you believe that he has been around for a long time? Do you don't think maybe by now a touch of dementia might be setting in? been here for a long time. He doesn't age. He's ageless. He never sleeps. And he's not, orient he's not disoriented because he locks sleeps. And he doesn't need a double-double. And he doesn't need Red Bull. He is fully alert and know exactly what's going on because he never make up things in time. He knows the end from the beginning. So when he said the end of all things, what I want you to think of, you have never stopped it, you've never stopped to think about it. I touched on it the last time and I said something. Now I want you to really zero in on it. What are the all things? God said that the end of all, all things is at hand. What are the all things? First thing I want you to start with. Both good and bad. Even the good things are at hand. They're going to end. Isn't it the sea a good thing? And in Revelation he said there will be no more seas. Isn't the sun a good thing? Wow, sun, vitamin D. I remember how many weeks passed and I did not see the sun peep out. Of course, it's still up there, but didn't peep out. And now I understand why people can be really depressed during winter. Because the days are... Well, winter come back to Ontario now. And <laughs> when I took out this last night, my wife said, Hey! You, I said, why are, you excited? why are you behaving like that? She said, because you have been wearing even short sleeve and wearing shirts and behaving. I said, there hasn't been much winter around. Did you notice that? <laughs> it came back now. <laughs> but the Bible said, even the sun will not be in the new world to come. There will be no light of the sun. There will be no light of the moon. And you're looking at me and saying, how could that be? When God started creation, day one, there was no sun. But there was light. The light in day one is not sun and it's not moon. It's day four that the sun and the moon was created. So if, there is, if day four was when sun and moon created, what light was in day one, two, and three? He said, let there be light. And he was specific when the sun was created. He said, let there be lights, right? To, to give to signs and seasons and so on. And he tell you now, the sun to rule the Day, the moon to rule the night. But that's not what was said in, in verse what, three? When he said, let there be light. So that was a different light. So that's the light we're going back to in Revelation. So the sun is temporary. 
It has been around for millennia and it has been faithful to raise every morning, every day from the east and set in the west. But it's temporary. I hear somebody say, Pastor, take time with me. It's written, I'm not making it up. It's in the book. Those are places that we never want to read because we love earth. We love the sea. We love the sun. We love the white sun, right? We, we want to go on vacation. Then God, then, then Pastor, you mean to say, when the Lord returns, we're not going on no vacation? No more all-inclusive Patty and jerk, pork and jerk, chicken, and sweet potato pudding. That's over. <laughs> Eat all you can now. <laughs> and you know the beautiful thing about it? You will not remember it. So there will be no desire and you will never miss it. You're not going to be thinking about your loved ones that did not make it in. Because you will not have any memory of it. Because if you could have the memory of it, it would cause you. It would actually open the door for you to be. So God is going to wipe away all tears. So if, if he's wiping away the tears, it means that whatever would cause you also to be tearful, it's going to be erased also. Thank God for that. Because you don't want to be in that world. I think about your mother that didn't make it in and your granny. Oh, you mean my granny where we always go to her house and she always have something for me to eat. Such a nice lady and she never, she not make it. No, sir, God, you're wicked. I mean, we can stay here with your God. Because how could you not let my grandma, my grandma come in here? She had a will. She had a will. Your children have a will. Some of you right now causing your children to cause you to be in and out. Oh, you need to make sure that you're in. And you're not here. Your destiny is not here for your children. Your destiny is for God. And along the path, he allow you to give birth. Whatever, however it come about. You are not, re you see, after they reach certain age, you are not responsible for them. Their decision, the consequences, it's theirs. That's why there was a parable in Israel at one time. The father eat the sour grape and set the children teeth and edge. God say, son of man, I do not want to hear you say that again. <laughs> do not use that parable anymore in Israel. He said, the soul that sin shall surely die. And he says, I will not hold the father guilty for the son or the son for the father. So if the father sin, the father will die. And if the son sin, the son will die if he refuse to repent. Do not use it anymore. That the father heat the sour grip and it set the children teeth on it. Some of you need to hear that because you are allowing your children to iffy. 40 year old man. Me not talk about one five year old and eight year old pit, you know. The, in back full of year like a gorilla. He's a grown man. They know exactly what they're doing. They have a desire and they do not have a desire for the things of God. And you can't tie him up in the basement. It's not a movie. You cannot lock him up in the basement and lock her up in the basement and say, you need to serve God. And until you decide that you're going to serve God, I will not let you out here. Polly, you will go to prison. <laughs> you will go to prison for unlawful imprisonment <laughs> wives you cannot lock up your husband in the room cuff him to the bed foot and say thou shall thou will not come from come out of this room until thou givest thy life as to the Lord is you can't 
Your husband has the right to choose God or not to choose God. Wow. Your wife has the right to choose God or not to choose God. And what you need to do. I see some examples in the scripture. That Samuel's sons did not know God and they never worship and serve God. But it never caused Samuel to lose focus of who he is and did what he did. The Bible said not one of his words fell to the ground. And he died in the Lord. He is a part of, he's a part of something unique with God. Samuel. In Ezekiel chapter 13, I think it is, that God was saying something to Ezekiel. He said that when I bring a sword upon the land and destruction or whatever, he said, even though Noah, Job, and Daniel is in the land, and he said, even if they had prayed, I would not take away the judgment. And I said to my wife, why God said Noah, Job, and Daniel? Something unique about these three persons. We know that God doesn't show favoritism. So why would God mention these three men's name? And said that even if they were in the land. You remember in Noah days what God did with Noah? You remember in Job time what God did with Job? You remember with Daniel what God did with him? And God said even if these three men were in the land and they prayed, I would not take away the judgment. But he said for their righteousness, they would be delivered, but not the people. Wow. There are some persons that had some unique connection with God. Unique connection with God. And these things are written for us to understand that if they did, I too can. Because God is not partial. But the question is now, you have to think about it. Why did they come into that? Why did they come into it? They had a desire. A deep desire. Stronger than life itself. Let me stop. This is um, a long weekend, right? So we should have a long... <laughs> I'm, on, I'm only kidding. <laughs> oh, family day weekend, right? Wow. Mm, family day weekend. So we're with family. So we start hours early. But I want you to look at a few short um, uh, verses of scripture with me. First one is Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. To answer the question, the end of all things is at hand. And I ask the question, why? The church talk about, they have the bogus teaching called rapture. It's a knockoff, it's a counterfeit, it doesn't work, it will never work. And whoever believe it, it leaves them in a compromised position. Then the next thing that the church also holds on to is that God is going to take all of us who believe in Christ, we love Jesus, he's going to take us into heaven. And we're going to live with him in heaven for, for how long? Forever. So the idea behind that is as if there's one idea that God is going to judge the wicked in the earth. And then the next thing now, when we think that we're going to go to heaven and live with God forever, is as if the earth is still going to be in existence, but God is going to abandon it. So it's just going to be an empty earth down here. And we all up in heaven, floating in clouds, angel dropping grape and raisin in our mouth. And we're just enjoying, you know, um, you, you know that advertisement that they have with the angel and the butter? Uh, what, cream, it's cream cheese? Philly, <laughs> Philly cream cheese, right? So, 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 so we're not going to float in heaven and all, you're not going to have some angel butter and um, bagel. All, um, everything bagel with Philly cream cheese. Uh -uh. 
God will still have a plan for the earth even after this earth age ends. What did we read in 2 Peter chapter 3? Nevertheless, we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The earth, God still have a plan for it beyond. In Revelation chapter 21, what have we read? I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven. Remember? Remember? Coming down. And he says, notice, he who sits on the throne says, behold, watch this, I make all things new. It did not say, I bring in new things. I make all things new. There's a difference with you bringing in new things and making all things new. So the earth will be made new. The heavens will be made new. <laughs> wow. And God have that power because he, he took you and I out of sin and made us what? He didn't bring a new Bobby. He made the whole Bobby new. The old man passed away. And he made me new. It's the same, same, same. But he made me new in the same house. And he made me new. And when he comes, if I die, my body is going to be resurrected in the glorious form that it is meant to be in. But it's, it's the same body. When Jesus was from the dead, sister came, they recognized that it was Jesus. It, the body didn't change. The only difference is because he still, he even still had the scar. He says, come, look at my hand, look at my side. But the difference is now, the body take on a different dimension to it, that he could go through a wall. He didn't have to open door anymore. <laughs> it just, it just come, it just appear. <sighs> Whew. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 32. Now learn this parable. When the fig tree, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you, so you also, so you also. Notice. When the fig tree learn, notice Jesus said, learn this parable. In this room today, those of you that are watching and listening, those of you that are going to come on later on, I am saying this to you, learn this parable, get this parable. When, the, when it's branch, when the fig tree, when the fig tree, learn this parable from the fig tree, learn this parable from the fig tree, when it's branch has already become tender, and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, what things? You go from verse 1 and read coming down. You remember the things that he talked about? He said, when you see all these things, the end of all things is at hand. When you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. It it what? Huh? I hear somebody say something. Who said it? Huh? Oh my goodness. The end of all things is at hand, yes, but the it there is not talking about the end of all things. Let me show you. Hold on. I want you to think, you see. I don't want you to just read like you read before. He said, it is near at the door. Right? At the doors. You, you, you pay attention, sir. Pay attention, sir. Verse 34 says, I'll, I'll surely, I say to you, this generation will by no means passed away till all these things Things take place. Verse 35, and I stop right there. 
in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 says, heaven and earth, heaven and earth. So in making all things new, the old heaven is going to pass away and the old earth is going to pass away. Notice heaven and earth will, it's not maybe, heaven and earth as we know it now will pass away. But watch this, but my words will by no means pass away. You, 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 you get the idea? Passed away. You get it? Mark chapter 13, verse 29. Same thing, but we're going to see some further explanation for you to get a further, some further understanding of what he's saying. We're going to end up in Luke, and you're going to see what the it looks like. In verse 38 of Mark, chapter 13, did I say 38? 28. 28. 28. Mark 13, verse 28 to verse 31. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, when you see these things happening, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Why am I reading it the same thing from Mark? And as I said, you're going to see a difference in words that is giving us further understanding. It's not contradicting. Number one, the scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So this is not a joke. This is not something to take lightly. Matthew, write it because it's important. Mark, write it because it's important. Verse 31, heaven and earth will, will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Luke chapter 21, verse 29. Luke chapter 21, verse 29, going down to verse 33. Then he spoke to them a parable. Then he spoke to them a parable. Matthew and Mark said, learn this parable. Or, Mar, or, or Matthew said, learn this parable from the fig tree. Luke says, then he spoke a parable to them. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at this. Look at, look at, look at the fig tree. I want to believe that Jesus was pointing to the fig tree when he was talking to them. He said, look at the fig tree. And all the trees, all the trees, and, and in, 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 a, in, a, in another month or, or so, what, we're in February, we're past the middle of it already, so March, spring starts in March, so is it, we still have about a month, right? Spring is going to start in March, and we're going to see not just fig trees, because I don't know if those fig trees even exist in Canada because of the climate. There are certain trees that they are native to certain climate. But you're going to see the trees here in Canada, the, the maple, name it, all of these trees. They're going to start to bud again. And they're going to, we, not only are we going to see spring, but we're also thinking of summer that is on the threshold of spring. He said, in Luke he says, learn Listen, he said, it spoke a parable to them saying, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves. I asked a question earlier on. Why do we need to hear about this teaching? Why am I talking about this? Because some of the teaching people think this is not necessary. So I'm not going to be paying attention to what he's saying. He said, learn this parable. And now Luke says, then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves 
that summer is now near. Watch verse 31. You remember in Matthew it said, it is near at hand. Mark said, it is near at hand. What is the it? Because with the end of all things, with the end of all things being at hand, there is something that continues to be consistent that existed before creation and it will continue. While everything else is coming to an end, there is something that will not come to an end. And those of you that have been following the teaching, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 says, while everything is shaking, there is something that cannot be shaken. And that's what God gave to us. The question is, the question is, did you receive it? And it's not a question right now if things are shaking. Canada is shaking. The UK is shaking. The Caribbean is shaking. Everywhere, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. In government, in name it, everything that can be shaken. COVID came in and allowed us to see something that had never happened in any generation before. Where we saw every single industry pause. Everything locked down. And people say, the rapture is here. <laughs> and for weeks, we were told to turn your yard. We saw the streets empty. Football, soccer, name it. Everything, movie theaters, everything locked down. Which of us have ever thought that we would ever see something like that in our generation? None. Because we think everything was just going to go. And now it's a testimony that everything, everything can come to an end. It can be shaken and it can come to an end. There was nothing going on. Production and movies and shows, pause. They said to us to control the spread of the virus, we're going to stop everything. And we're going to, if we, we permit you to go out and get the, the, the necessary stuff. And when you go to get it, make sure you keep your distance. Don't tell nobody no money, don't hug them. Stay from a distance and say, hi. And make sure that they can't see your teeth. And it got to the point that if you didn't have a mask, no entry. What a world. What a world. Now look at this. Verse 31. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the... <laughs> now, what is it saying here? When it said the kingdom of God is near. Because if the kingdom of God is here right now, how is it? How is it? At that point, at that juncture, in whatever is happening, it's near. Listen to me carefully. It's the climax, the culmination of everything that God concluded with himself before time. And he brought man in time, and he knew that man was going to sin because he gave him a will to choose him as father. And he allowed all of it, Satan come into the picture, everything, and he allows it all to play out. But watch this. It all starts with the kingdom. And it's going to end... With the kingdom. Alpha. Omega. Beginning. End. So everything is playing out in the middle. Because he permitted it. 
He permitted it. The question is, why? What is it that God wants to show off between all of that? So when dumb preachers are saying that the kingdom of God is not here now, it's coming. No, it's what's ending. It's what's ending everything. And if it's going to end it, it means that it started it. So the present reality of the kingdom of God is Christ coming in time and redeeming us from sin. So now we are redeemed and we're restored to God as sons. And God continued to do what he's doing with us as son in time. And while Satan's kingdom is being judged, the sons of God is still in the earth and God is doing what he's doing. Because what begun time with man being placed in time, Adam, Adam, came in time as a son of God. So God is going to continue with that to the very end. Because how are we ending up in the kingdom? How are we ending? When the kingdom, with, with the kingdom being ending everything, how are we ending in there? As sons. The scripture tells us clearly in the Bible that we're going to shine forth in the kingdom of the Father. Notice, in the kingdom of the Father. So there is a period, there's a period somewhere in time where Christ, as the Son, is going to give up his reign to the Father in, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So even that is a part of the end of all things being at hand. So the present reign of Christ right now Christ is going to hand it over back to the Father because the Father gives him a grant of authority coming in time to rule over the present kingdom right now. So right now, when we got born again, wherever we got born again, whatever time we got born again, according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, we were translated from the kingdom of darkness. Because when we're saying that the kingdom of God is not present, there is another kingdom present right now. And it's the kingdom of Satan. So when we're born again, we're taken out of one kingdom. And notice what it says. And we're placed into the kingdom of the, of the Son Son of his love. There comes a moment when the son will hand over the reign back to the father. So that it's proven that the father is all in all. And then at the end of it all, there will be the new Jerusalem. A new heaven and a new earth. And we will reign with him forever in that new Jerusalem. So the kingdom continues. The kingdom continues. It's not a joke. It's not a made up thing. It's not something that God caught on after he created man. It was there before. And then it says, verse 32, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. One last passage I'm looking at and close. And pick up on the ne in the next fasting, I will continue this. Because I need to show you why the end of all things is at hand. I'm, I'm telling you a little of it, but I don't know if you're getting it. I want to show you in the scripture why is it so. And that it's not an accident. Before time began, God saw the end. Before time began, God saw the end. Anybody hearing me? Before time began, God saw the end. If it was you, you would have changed things up here. If it was you, and you see that the man that you're going to create, and you want him to choose you as father, and he's going to use his will to choose to rebel against me, wouldn't you wipe it out and rewrite it? But no, he didn't. Why? Because some of us even say, if God knew that man was going to sin, why did he make him? 
And if God knew that Lucifer, angel, son of light, son of the morning, that's what Lucifer means. If God knew that an angel would rebel against him and become an enemy against him, why make him? Why make the angels? Because the plants have a will, rivers have a will, the sea have a will, fish have a will, birds have a will. Everything has a will. But the will is unique in, in its creation. What's the will of the tree? Have you, you, know, you didn't know? It has a will. What's the will of the tree? <laughs> And in bearing fruit and doing what it does, who gets the glory from it? Because why, why God get the glory from it? Because he created it. So when God created the angels, he also gave them a will. Because in order for them to serve him, they needed a will. God is not making computers. It's not chips being put in them and they're being programmed. They're given a will to choose to serve him. So now, you know the scripture tells us that angels is made to serve. They are servant spirits. One of the angels had a bright idea. When you think and look at what God's plan is, and this is where the big problem is, you know. Man. You want to call him Mankind. This is where the problem is. After the angel came into creation, the angels came into creation, Lucifer is given an, a position to function from and use his will to carry out that responsibility. He began to look. And he realized the human that has a body that placed tremendous limitations on him, God chose him a son. And we are just servants. So what produced Satan is jealousy, envy. So when he saw that God chose man to be son over the angels, he began to whisper to some other angels and said, this is not right. Uh-uh. We need to do something about it. And a few of them take side with him. And they say, he says, I will tell you. I will give you a sign when we're going to revolt. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to take him off the throne. So watch me. And when I give it a cue, move with me. Not knowing that God know <laughs> before he's even created so when the thought enter his mind, God said, Michael, I want you to deal with him. You remember the Bible said there was war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And we know that the dragon is the old serpent, the devil and Satan. And he was cast out of his position. And the angels that rebelled with him, the Bible said they were put in chains under darkness, reserved until the day of judgment. The end of all things is at hand. So even the judgment of the angels will now come to an end. And when he was cast out, God permitted him to come into the earth and test man's will. Just as how he permitted him to test Jesus' will. And when he tested man's will, the first son, he abandoned God as father. And opened the door to everything that we're seeing today. And God never put this in, he never intended for this to continue forever. He put an end on it from over here. Let me show you something non stop. Really. <laughs> what you're saying? Mm -hmm. No, it's not physical war. <laughs> 
Yeah. Absolutely. Even the warfare that we're in today, it's not physical. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So how does it play out? It's words. So the fiery darts of the enemy, it's words. So God give you something to deal with the words that is coming from Satan against your mind. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty true God to the pulling down of what? Every I thing that exalts itself against the knowledge, that which you know of God. How do you get the knowledge of God? Words. So there are words coming from the enemy to overthrow what you know about God. But your weapons that you have, they are not carnal. They are mighty to the pulling down. Of strongholds, pulling down every thought, every imagination, because you think things and your thoughts can take you into places that is ungodly and that is really dark. But God say you have weapons to pull them down. I want to end with this. Which where did I where did I tell you to go? Matthew chapter eight. Matthew chapter eight. Two verses, two verses, verse 28 and 29. When he, Jesus, had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tomb. I want you to pay attention to something that you never stopped to think about before. Coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. Wow. And suddenly, watch this, and suddenly they cried out, saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus? What have we to do with you, Jesus? And notice, they knew that he was so demons knows, demons knows if you are really a son of God. And if you are a hypocrite, they also knows. Watch this. What have we to do with you, Jesus? Watch this. Notice what the demon says. You, like, 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 watch this. It's like you're trying to hide it, but you can't hide from us. What have we to do with you, Jesus? You, son of God. Are, are you seeing it? Are you seeing the tone? Are you seeing the, the attitude with them? You, you think you can hide from us? You can hide from other people, but not from us. You, son of God. You see, watch this. Have you come here to torment us before? I'm stopping here. Wait, that has been there all along, and you read it many times. But what did you think of it? Demons know that the end is near. Have you come to torment us before what time? Before what time? So, if so, so why am I talking about times and season, God? If demons are aware of it, shouldn't those who say that they're of God even be more aware of the end of the age? Because whether you want to believe it or not, whether you receive it or not, demons are preparing themselves for the end. And they're even saying to Jesus, come on, we know that the end is coming, but why you want to? Come on, get... <laughs> Let us at least have fun to the end. <laughs> Do you know the true meaning and purpose of the tribulation? Do you think it's to judge humans, to destroy humans? Humans will be judged and humans will be destroyed, of course. But they are not the main focus. And how did the human get in there in the first place? 
they were deceived I rest my case the end of all things is at hand and demons are aware of it that's not good <laughs> we didn't put it there that take time to build up somebody not doing their work right anyway <laughs> the end of all things <laughs> is at hand times and seasons in God how God started the creation how God started the creation the creation will end with it how God started the creation the faithfulness of God the consistency the the cohesiveness of truth because this is truth truth never changes time changes but truth never changes truth is constant and so the truth of what God is about started creation and it will end creation and while everything that is in the middle opposing what God wants to accomplish he permits it to run its course but it has an end even the state of the church today did you know that God was going to, God knows that the church was going to be in the state that it's in right now and God permit it and he's also judging it so the end of all things the mess that we have seen in the church for years it's coming to an end and God in the midst of it is even judging to the point where we're seeing preachers falling down physically dying right in the very pulpit and this year there is going to be more and there's a lot of them that has been covering up stuff and acting like they're representing God. And God says, no, you will no longer hide and pretend that you're representing me. I am going to expose you. The end of all things is at hand. Are you getting the warning? Watch how you're living. Because Jesus says, whatever is done in the dark, it's going to come to light. And whatever is done inside the house, it's going to be announced on the house stop. Check your life. If I'm a pretender, if I have been pretending for 13 plus years in front of you, watch it. It's only a matter of time because the law has already been established whatsoever a man sows that he will reap god bless you i love you and i pray to god that the word that the spirit has released in this room today that when you walk out of this room whatever you came in here with and those of you who come on to watch whatever you came on with that is not of god you will on purpose permit god to strip it from you let go of your ego let go of yourself and give the father room to be who he ought to be in you and who you ought to be in him and put him on display there is a true vine and no false branch can remain in that true vine every branch that doesn't bear fruit so it's not only those who are refusing to be son but those who are refusing to let the fruit produce to let the truth come forth you will be removed you will be removed because if god allow false branch to remain in the true vine it is going to compromise the overall effects of the vine the vine is true the one who is caring for the vine is true. Only branches that are of the truth can remain and bring forth fruit. Stand with me, please.
When we hear the term God is sovereign, some of us even use it. And I wonder how many of us really stop to really think about it and to get what that really looks like. A sister sent me this question she was reading in the book of Acts, and she got to chapter 17, where it says that God made of one blood, God made of one blood, every nation, God made of one blood, every nation that exists on the face of the earth. And she wanted to have an understanding of what that looks like. She said, are we a part of that statement? And he said, yes. How did that happen? How did that come about? In the beginning, there was only one nation. In the beginning, they only spoke one language. In the beginning, they were in one location. And they wanted to stay in the one location. They wanted to keep their one language. So they decided to build a tower with its top reaching up to heaven. And they said, lest we be scattered, we're going to design a city that will keep us together. And when they decided to do it, God visit the project to inspect it and to see what they were up to. And when God saw where they were projected to go, God said, if we allow them to continue this part, nothing that they plan will be kept from them doing it. Wow. Because, watch this, because the people are one. So God on purpose confounded the one language. So, for instance, say that they were all speaking Italian. And then all of a sudden, when God confounded the language, it's a hundred, say a hundred of them is there. And God confounded the language. All 100 were speaking the same language, speaking Italian. Buongiorno. Let's get the pizza and the macaroni and the lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> huh? That's an accent. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, this one is still speaking, and then the other one responding. Chinese coming out, Arabic coming out. And he said, What are you talking about? I'm not getting what you're saying. And then they realize all the other 99 persons is speaking another language. God did that on purpose. So God is the one who created the nations, not man. They talk about the founding fathers of Canada. They talk about the founding fathers of the United States of America. Founding fathers, my foot. God, on purpose, allowed these nations to be. And every nation is placed exactly where God wanted to be. And even if the nation never served God, they are a part of God's plans being worked out to the end. That's God being sovereign. That's God being sovereign. The rain doesn't fall without God's knowledge. The scripture said even a bird Jesus said the sparrow. He said not one sparrow fall to the ground and die without God's knowledge. He says, how much more? You, you are of greater value. That's God being sovereign. He said, notice, notice. This is yours? <laughs> <laughs> Watch God. Do you know how many strands of hair in your head? Is it possible for you to know? But how would you count it? I mean, that's, that's, that. And here the scripture says, it says every
They can't even see this on the camera. He said, God knows this. What number is this to God? God know what number this is, sister. Sister Jackie, God knows what number this is. And he knows. And guess what? He gives it a name. So when, I, when you go to the, the ear salon and, you know, and when it falls to the ground and they sweep it up and they put it and they throw it in the dirt bin, God knows what number went there. You don't. He says, the number, your ear of your head, they are all numbered and named by God to show you how valuable. It's not ear that God is concerned about. It's not here. It's you. But he's saying, if I take the time, if I take the time, oops, if I take the time to number a name you're here that you don't care about, it is saying how much I care about you. I care about you. Wow. Sovereign. You bring Abram out one night. Has to be in the night. And he said to Abram, can you number the stars? <coughs> can you number the stars? Because whatever we're seeing about stars, it's a small fraction that we can see with the natural eyes. He said, can you number the stars? And then he said, look at, this, look at the sun. Look at the sun on the seashore. He said, can you number the sun? He said, so will your descendants be. Wow. So it wasn't only Israelites, it wasn't only Jews that God was talking about where Abraham is concerned. His descendants come down to you and I, because if you then be Christ, then are you Abraham's sons, seeds. Why are we struggling? Why are we struggling? Why are we struggling? Knowledge, and I'm not talking about mere knowledge. Knowledge is lacking. Understanding is missing. And the enemy never wants you to come into that. You are of great value to the things of God being played out even in the end of the age, as the end of all things is at hand, in the midst of it all, what does God want the church to be like in these days? What does he want the church to look like? Revelation chapter 1 all the way to chapter 5 gives us a clear picture of how the church is supposed to continue even during the time of the tribulation. We are a kingdom of priests a holy nation among the nations. Because while God is judging everything and bringing everything to an end, the world is supposed to see a nation that is under God's perfect government and how God is caring for them and doing what he's doing that give them hope in the midst, that even in that moment, even in all of that happening, it still give hope that they can escape. They can escape. But the state of the present church today is not showing that. And that's why even in this room today, God is speaking to a remnant. Can we hear him? And be willing to let go of our hypocrisy and everything that is stopping Christ from being formed in you. Where people no longer see you, but the perfect Christ. But the perfect Christ. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this privilege and this opportunity that you have given unto us to come together one more time. In this room, in this spot of ground, and this Father, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know that this era is known as square one. Father, you have allowed us to be here. And irrespective of what others may think or say or what people may do or whatever, Father, you are speaking to us in the very name of the place. 
and allowing us to understand that because we keep on missing, we keep on missing, we continue to remain locked in our opinion, we continue to stay locked in our emotions, we continue to do what is right in our own eyes, we continue to multiply disobedience, we continue to multiply rebellion. Father, we continue to practice the cultures of the world, we continue to practice their customs, and refusing to let go of what is of the world, so that we can be separated and live holy and righteous and separated as kings and priests and that holy nation that you intend for us to be, being that light that is set on a hill, being that city that is set on a hill that is giving light, hope, light and hope to the nations around us. Father, we refuse to give ourselves to it, but you continue to speak because you know that there is a people that you have already sealed in the earth realm and don't those who have an ears to hear, they're the one that will be able to be separated. So, Father, thank you for your word that has been released today. I pray that it will not fall by the wayside. I pray that it will not fall by the stony ground. I pray that it will not fall among the thorns, but it will fall in the good soil, the good ground, and it will germinate. It will sing deep, and it will bring forth some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold, where we're completely transformed into the very image of the Christ, the pattern son, from glory to glory. Father, thank you. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. That the warfare that we're engaging, it's a warfare that is surrounded by words. By words. The fiery darts are words. <laughs> they are words coming from the wicked one. But the shield of faith is supposed to quench it quench it because when you confess and declare who you are in Christ when you confess and declare who God is it quenches the lie it quenches the lie it put out the lie and allows you to remain in freedom so father you continue to speak to us and may we recognize the principle of how you speak to us may we recognize the pattern that you have put in place. May we recognize the medium that you have put in place that when we come together as your people or wherever we are and that principle is in operation, we submit ourselves to it so that we experience the life that you intend for us to come into, that you gave your son to bring into this world because he says, whoever believes on me will never perish but have everlasting life. It's a state, it's a quality, it's a place, it's a position that we're placed in when we come to know your son. And Father, I thank you for this privilege today. That you have sent your son into this world. He became a human. He took on humanity. He dwelt among us. Lived among us. Walked among men. Died and rose again. To bring forth many sons. To the father. I am a son of God. I am a son of the living God. I am, the, I am a son of the living God. My purpose and my destiny is to please my heavenly Father. So, Father, let your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. So, Father, everything that I am, everything that I have, I give it all to you so that your will be done here on earth, even as it is already established and done in heaven. I pray, Holy Spirit, that we will give you the freedom to take your rightful place in our lives and allow you to speak to us, and that when you speak, we now be on a shadow of a doubt that it's you speaking from the heart of the Father. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will have that place in our life exactly the way that the Father has purposed for it to be. And that we will all be led 
by the Spirit of God. Legitimizing our sonship because as many as are led by you, they are legitimate sons of the living God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here. I receive you afresh today. I receive you. And whatever it is that is hindering you from taking your full place in my life, I pray that you will highlight it, expose it, and that it will be removed, it will be destroyed immediately, and that every area of my life, my entire body, will be the perfect temple of the Holy Spirit in time, bringing glory and honor to the Father because I am purchased with the price which cannot be matched by anything in this world. So, Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for another moment, another time to come together in this area, in this room, hearing your word, for another moment to come together on our television and our radio to hear your word and for it to transform us and bring us into the exact, exact, exact alignment with truth and with who you are. So, Father, as we leave, may you continue to have freedom to speak to us and to bring further clarity as we think on these things. You will bring us further understanding because you want to. You want to. So may we desire it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. I bless you. It's good to see those of you that are here. Those of you that join us, good to have you. Enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. And God's willing, I will see you tomorrow. I will see you soon. Goodbye.